Good afternoon, everybody. I would like everyone, please, to take a seat so we can begin. I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the Evo Institute, and thank you all very, very much for coming to this afternoon's program. Um, those of you who were here this morning, if any of you were, you witnessed a wonderful, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, a glorious thing. We had something like 30 to 50 children here, between the ages of three to 10. They heard Yiddish songs. They saw a Yiddish puppet show. They, saw, they, they, they listened to a Yiddish story told by Shane Baker. They made vegetable soup. They had rock candy. It was beautiful. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I was told, I was told uh, that probably in Vilna, children hovered constantly around the Evo Institute. Indeed, I know that there were some children zomlers who went into the marketplace. I think we have one here. Please stand up. <laughs> But uh, since our relocation uh, in New York, I don't think children have been that much of a presence at the Evo Institute. Indeed, if you look at the guide for the Evo Institute archives, there is no entry for children. And yet, we have tremendous resources. We have tremendous riches that represent some of the great legacy of East European Jewish culture, but also what the lives of actual children were. We have their drawings. We have their algebra uh, books in Yiddish. We have the maps that they drew in Yiddish of the world in school. We have we have uh, um, conduct books from the 19th century in which teachers wrote down what each child was doing. We have the films in our archive of the children of Vilna. We have diaries. We have letters. We have so much that helps us understand not just what the life of the community was before it was cut short in the catastrophe of the Shoah. But what also this special element of that life known as childhood was, how did these children get taught? What did they eat? How did they, what cultural resources were at their disposal? How is it that so many of those children became Sigmund Freud or Edmund Husserl or the physicists and scientists who built the atom bomb for Stalin or the great industrialists and magnates or the gangsters or the ordinary people who simply through the conduct of their lives continued the tradition that Yivo honors and perpetuates today. What was this? And so we have today what we have called Children's Day. And the first part was for the children, and the second part is for the adults. And in conversation with some scholars, it became evident to me that Jewish childhood is actually a somewhat understudied uh, element of our self-knowledge. And so I see this, and I know that Max Weinreich had a great interest in this, particularly the lives of adolescents, and we're going to hear quite a bit about that today. But I hope 
that what we begin today, we will carry forward in the future with other programs and develop more ways by which the Evo Institute can make our riches available for people, not just here in New York, not just children here in New York, but ultimately through the online museum that we are in the process of beginning to build to Jewish people of Ashkenazi descent all over the world. I urge all of you at the conclusion of today's program, if you have not already done so, to go to the third floor and see the exhibition of materials that we have up there. It is astonishing. In addition to rare, uh, in some cases unique, Yiddish children's books that we have on display, there is a whole magnificent display of children's toys, which you will hear, hear more about later. There are photographs, there are artifacts of all kinds from which you will understand the great diversity of this childhood that we're talking about. It was not one childhood. There were many childhoods. And it is, I think, really necessary for us to pay more attention to this part of our history if we're ever going to really get to an understanding of how it was that the Jewish people who came here to America, who went to Germany, who went to Russia, became the great ballerinas, became the great writers, the scholars, the physicists, and the businessmen. And so, uh, saying no more, uh, I simply want to uh, quote two passages that have always uh, seemed extremely relevant to me. The first is from Sholem Aleichem's memoir. Was there a connection between fiddling and knowledge? Well, there was a connection. In those days, the violin played an honorable role in the program of knowledge. He's speaking of his childhood. You had to know everything, Sholem Aleichem writes. And in a story by Isaac Babel, called Sabbaths, a Sabbath at Grandmother's. He writes, on Sabbaths, after six classes, I came home late. I hated my violin teacher at that moment. I hated the scales, the incomprehensible, pointless, shrill music. Study, his grandmother suddenly and forcefully said. Study, and you can have everything, wealth and glory. You must know everything. Everyone will fall on their knees before you and bow to you and let them envy you. Don't believe in people. Don't have friends. Don't give them your money. Don't give them your heart. That was a Jewish grandmother <laughs> for many of us. Thank you. Sam. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for inviting me here uh, to talk about Jewish youth movements, which is a uh, huge, huge topic. Uh, I recall my mother telling me uh, about her 15-year-old sister, uh, Chaya. There were eight kids in the family, and... Uh, this was a family headed by uh, my grandfather, who was nicknamed in the shtetl Sam the American. I'm named after him because he lived in New York City, but uh, preferred to make his life in Poland, so he went back. And uh, while he was rather religious and uh, traditional, uh, his children indeed joined youth movements. Uh, my mother joined the Bin, or the Bee, 
uh, founded by the YIVO's own Max Weinreich. And there were various levels of the bean. Uh, there was the ring, there was the kate, there was the knup, then there was the binstock or the beehive, and then there was the erste bean, and that was Max Weinreich himself. And uh, the bean uh, encouraged a love of Yiddish, a love of nature, it encouraged doikait, uh, a love of the region, a love of, of the terrain where you are. And of course, it was so idealistic that it couldn't last. It, more and more kids said, well, uh, there's not enough politics, and ultimately it was infiltrated by communists and it collapsed. One of my mother's younger sisters, Chaya, 15, was in the Hashomer Hatzair, which was totally different from the Bean, totally negated the diaspora, totally negated Do. It only thought of Dogen, and I understand that her uh, being in the Hashomer Hatzair cost my grandfather uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of good health. Uh, and uh, he, she had a dream of someday going to Israel and living on a kibbutz. Her whole life was bound up with a Hashomer, but unfortunately she was murdered uh, in June 1942. As I talk about youth movements, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, uh, I'm not an original scholar of youth movements. I've learned quite a lot from the work of uh, Moshe uh, Kliegsberg of Kamil Kayek, who's, who's just now publishing a book on Jewish young people in Poland. Uh, the uh, work in Hebrew of Ido uh, Basok for the Bundes Youth Movements, Jack, Jack Jacobs, uh, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet, Jeffrey Chandler, uh, Marcus Mosley, uh, and there are a lot of people that uh, you should. Uh, read if you really want to know a lot about youth movements. But in no period in the whole sweep of Jewish history uh, have youth move, did youth movements play as an important role as they played in interwar Poland. Uh, up to 100,000 young people may have been members of youth movements. Now let's say the entire cohort uh, from the age 14 to the age of 21 was 450,000. So while youth movement members were a minority, uh, if you do a proportional comparison, there's no question that youth movement membership in Jewish Poland was probably the highest proportion in the entire world. And Without the youth movements, just thinking ahead, jumping ahead, there would have been no uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. There would have been no resistance movement in the Vilna Ghetto. There would have been no resistance movement in the Bialystok Ghetto. It's important to understand the context of these youth movements. And we begin with the terrible effects of World War I on East European Jewry. The devastation, the fighting occurred in the areas of densest Jewish settlement. And we tend not to think that much about World War I because the Holocaust has overshadowed all the other suffering. But uh, during World War I, not only were many Jews killed, not only did many, many Jews lose their homes, but 750,000 Jews were turned into refugees. And then there was a typhus epidemic and an influenza epidemic and then draconian immigration restrictions. While the American Immigration Bill only went into effect in 1924, De facto, it became increasingly difficult to get into the United States after 1919. And all of these uh, uh, traumas had a terrible effect on family life and on the relationship between parents and kids. And we see that very clearly in the uh, YIVO autobiographies, which are the single best source 
on young people in uh, pre-war uh, Poland. These young people grew up in a Polish Republic, which on paper uh, promised equal rights to everybody, but in fact uh, discriminated against the 40% of the population that was not Polish, and uh, discriminated in very many painful ways against that 10% of the population that was uh, Jewish. Now, Jewish-Polish relations were going downhill before World War I. And World War I only made things worse. And keep in mind that while we believe that World War I usually ended in 1918, in fact, in Poland, in effect, the war went on until 1921. In order for the Poles to get and defend their independence and carve out a territory after 124 years of partition, they literally had to fight everybody. They fought the Germans over Posen. They fought the Czechs over Teschen. They fought the Ukrainians over Lvov. They fought the Soviets for their very lives. They fought the Lithuanians for Vilna. And in all these battles, uh, for reasons that uh, uh, I don't want to get into, there was a tendency on the part of Poles to see Jews as an enemy that automatically sided with the uh, antagonists of this new Polish state. And when Poland finally stabilized in 1921 with a constitution that promised democracy, liberalism, freedom of speech, basic liberties, uh, this constitution, for all of its promises, could not put the Polish economy back together again. The Polish economy never really recovered from the uh, terrible damage of World War I. The Poles lost their markets, their pre-war markets in Tsarist Russia. Uh, the gross national product declined. Uh, and in an effort to at least provide jobs for Poles, the Polish government pursued a policy of taking over major branches of the economy, like tobacco and uh, alcohol, turning them into state monopolies, and firing all the Jews. And to deal with hyperinflation, the Polish government introduced a new currency, which had to be backed by American loans. And to service those loans, the Poles had to balance their budget. And they didn't want to do it by taxing the peasants or the nobles. So they imposed very heavy taxes on uh, urban storekeepers, on small shopkeepers. And this, too, had a devastating effect on Polish Jewry. Be, be, before the Great Depression of 1929, there were only two relatively good years in Polish economic life, 1926 and 1927. And then when the Great Depression was finally over by 1935 and the Polish economy began to revive, Josef Pilsudski, who didn't love Jews but who despised anti-Semites. Josef Pilsudski died, and the last four years uh, uh, of independent Poland, 1935 to 1939, was marked by ever-increasing economic discrimination. So in this tale of economic woe and discrimination, Jewish parents could no longer provide for their children the way they could before World War I. They couldn't uh, uh, give them a dowry. Uh, it was harder to take them into the family business because all too often the family business was being shut down by heavy taxes or by boycott. Uh, they uh, had a harder time sending them for uh, a training to even become a skilled craftsman. Uh, because in 1927, the Poles passed a law that said that even to be a tailor or a shoemaker, uh, you have to have a license. And to get that license, 
you have to pass exams, including a knowledge of the Polish language and much else. So this was another way of closing another door to Jewish kids. One of the most important uh, results of this economic deterioration was that we now see a stark clash between Jewish values and economic reality. Jewish values stressed that you wanted your kid to be balabatish. You wanted your kid to aspire to the status of the Shene Yidin. Uh, you wanted your, your kid, if possible, not to be a Stickel Schneider or a Stickel Schuster or a Baal Malocha, that means an, an artisan. Uh, there, was a, there was a status ladder in Jewish society which valued independence and, and the ability to be your own boss and which looked down on those who worked for others. But in fact, with the pauperization of much of the Jewish lower middle class in interwar Poland, there was no choice but to uh, prepare your child for life as a proletarian. And indeed, if we look at the occupational structure of Polish Jewry, we see far-reaching changes. If we compare 1921 to 1939, there's a, there's a major shift from small business and commerce to uh, factory work and uh, to shop work. And when Jews worked in factories, uh, they were worse off than Polish workers because these factories were smaller, they didn't qualify for unemployment benefits, they didn't qualify for health insurance. And as the Polish government began to modernize the economy, which uh, resulted in accelerated economic growth in 35, 36, 37, these new factories, needless to say, kept Jews out. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want to imply that the Jews in Poland were like deer looking at the headlights. Uh, I was the lead scholar on the interwar gallery of the Poland Museum, uh, part of a team headed by our great Barbara Kirschen Black Gimlet, and uh, I, did, I thought of the books written about interwar Poland, books like <laughs> On the Edge of Destruction by Celia Stupnitska Heller, uh, No Way Out by Emanuel Meltzer, uh, Affenran von Obgrund on the Edge of the Chasm by Jacob Bleszczynski. And of course, those titles reflect the fact that they were looking at this uh, amazing community through the prism of the Holocaust. And we didn't want to do that. Yes, the situation of Polish Jewry was dire. But many Polish Jews did not believe that it was hopeless. In the face of this worsening economic situation, a basic Jewish strategy, and that was especially advocated by the Bund in the 1930s, was to hunker down, to downsize, to bite the bullet, to, to go into the shops, to go into the factories, uh, to work for a lower wage. Uh, in the cities, you were less vulnerable to a uh, boycott. And in the meantime, young people would improve their job skills and would somehow find an economic niche until political conditions in Poland got better and the Polish parties like the PPS and the Peasant Party uh, would assume more power. Now, we could say from our perspective that was whistling past the graveyard, but at the time it seemed like a coherent strategy uh, to follow. But it certainly meant a total reconfiguration of the future of Jewish youth. In, a, in his own way, Max Weinreich said the same thing that if a Jewish kid in Poland doesn't mind being a garbage collector in Tel Aviv, then he shouldn't mind being a garbage collector in uh, Poland. And the key to survival is to downsize, to lower your expectations. But there's a new, there's a totally new context in considering all of this, which is that these Jewish kids in interwar Poland were the first generation 
uh, of East European Jews. Well, you know, maybe leaving out Galicia, which is a special case before World War I, but let me generalize. It was the first generation of East European Jews that uh, lived under a law which mandated compulsory education for boys and girls between the ages of 6 and 14. All kids had to go to school. And uh, by the late 1930s, over 80% of Jewish kids were going to elementary schools in the Polish language. And let's not kid ourselves. Except for the areas in the crest, in, in the borderlands of eastern Poland, where my family came from, the fact was that this new generation of Polish Jewish kids was increasingly speaking Polish. They were speaking Polish to each other, they were speaking Yiddish to their parents, but the Yiddish language was on the defensive. Moreover, in these Polish schools, and especially after the educational reform of 1932, these Polish schools aspired to teach on a very high level. Maybe, the, maybe many of the teachers were anti-Semites and mediocrity, but the curriculum had high aspirations. They were influenced by Dalton and by Montessori. They were influenced by new educational theories. There was mandatory music, mandatory art, mandatory gym. The buildings, compared to the old Jewish haters, were light and airy and modern. And especially problematic for Jewish kids was that they were getting a Polish education which, which embedded in them a love of Polish literature a love of Polish history, an admiration for the way the Polish people refused to buckle under to the oppressors. They fought for their independence. They protected their language. In spite of oppression, they produced great poetry and great theater and great art. And at the same time, these kids were told subtly by their teachers and not so subtly by their Polish classmates that they were less that they were simply not as good, that they belonged to a lower caste. And this took a, a terrible psychological toll. Now, many Jewish kids tried to avoid this psychological toll by, or deal with the psychological problem by joining the youth movements. And that was one of the major functions that they served to serve as kind of a defense mechanism, as compensation for the psychological burden of being a Jewish child in interwar Poland. And of course, many kids coped by going to Jewish schools. And there were excellent Jewish schools in interwar Poland, and I don't have the time to talk about them, but there were the Tsisho schools run by the Bund and the Linke Pilot Sion, which stressed Yiddish secular culture. Uh, closely allied to the Tsisho were the Tsebeka schools in the Vilna region, which were Yiddishist, but not necessarily Bundist or leftist. There were the Tarbut schools, uh, which stressed Hebrew and Zionism, and they were especially strong in the Kresi and in Galicia. The biggest network of all were the schools identified with the Aguda and with the Mizrahi, and one of the revolutionary uh, 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 transformations of the Aguda was to uh, establish Beis Yaakov schools for girls. They finally woke up to the fact that it's not a great idea to send religious girls to polar schools. Uh, so uh, Jewish education was an alternative and in these Jewish schools uh, uh, kids felt more secure, they felt much better but the Jewish schools were under a lot of uh, pressure. Many were closed down by the Poles on various uh, pretexts. They required tuition fees, which more and more uh, poor parents could not afford. And uh, only a minority of Jewish kids, with the exception of Jewish kids in the Vilna region, uh, uh, went to these Jewish schools as opposed to Polish schools. And then, of course, there was the question of what do you do 
when, when you've reached the age of 14. High school was not free, and the Polish government high schools were uh, increasingly unwilling to accept Jews beyond a small number. The private Jewish high schools cost a lot of money, so most kids ended their formal education at 14, and that was another reason for the youth movements, because that's where they could continue their education. And even if you went to one of those high schools and then got into a Polish university, increasingly careers like medicine and law were not for you. Uh, there was uh, a numerous clausus in the medical and law faculties, and by the late 1930s, Polish medical and uh, legal corporations were adopting the so-called Aryan paragraph. So the youth movements got a lot of their uh, energy and a lot of their stimulus from the fact that J Jewish youth increasingly felt that they were part of a generation that was facing closing doors. Now, there were many things that the youth movements in Poland had in common. And I'm going to talk about these common features before I get into the differences. On the one hand, the youth movements were uh, places where people could learn, where they could uh, really nurture their sense of idealism, their willingness to engage in self-sacrifice. On the other hand, these youth movements were composed of adolescents. And very often, they reflected the petty, rebellious, uh, uh, bloody-minded concerns of adolescents. Uh, in a town near where my parents lived, there was a beauty contest. And there was a picture in the Shtetl newspaper, which is contained here in the Evo Library, of the winning young woman. And she had a sash, uh, a la Atlantic City. And the sash said, Miss Glibok, Miss Glibok, sick. Apparently, what didn't get into the newspaper was that the winning girl was from Hashomer Hatzair. And, the Bet and Betar, the revisionists, said, you'll excuse this, uh, you'll excuse what I'm going to say, but they complained that she was ugly. She gave me a sphia malpe. And the only reason she won was because of political correctness, because she was a left winger. And a fist fight began after the contest. So on the one hand, the youth movements were full of idealism. And on the other hand, let's not forget that they could be quite petty. And keep in mind, as Max Weinreich pointed out in his Der Weg zu unserer Jugend, very often kids changed youth movements the way they changed their clothes. They went from one youth movement to another. But what were the things that the youth movements had in common? They had a, a room called the Lokal, a place where kids could meet. And it was like a second home. And at a time when so many Jewish kids lived four, five, six to a room, and living conditions were deteriorating, uh, this place to meet your peers and to, and to bask in the emotional support of your second family was very, very important. These youth movements had libraries. In interwar Poland, Jewish youth uh, were part of a reading culture. Uh, Moshe Kligsberg estimated that Jewish kids in Poland read 15 million books a year. That was his es uh, uh, estimate. And the libraries were very, very important. The books they tended to read uh, were usually uh, books written by non-Jewish authors, either in the original languages, Polish, in some cases Russian, or books translated into, into Yiddish or into Polish. They, they, they read Romain Roland. They read uh, 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 Remark. They read Gorky. They read Upton Sinclair. Uh, these Jewish kids wanted intellectually to break out of the ghetto to break out of this narrow Jewish world and to reach out and touch universal heroes and to be part of a universal drama. Uh, they, these youth movements uh, 
loved nature. There, were, uh, there was a great emphasis on hiking, on uh, uh, developing one's uh, physicality, on one's body. Sports were very important. Uh, these hikes would often take place on Saturdays. And of course, this was another example of how membership in a youth movement provoked clashes with religious parents. Clearly, being in the youth movement resulted in a certain tension with parents who were much more traditional, who were part of a culture that denigrated sports, that hated things like football, uh, that hated things like skiing or cross-country skiing, you'll, you'll catch a cold, what are you doing running around like a parodem, what, what are you doing running around like, a, like, like an animal? Uh, so these youth movements cultivated a totally different outlook on the body, on sports, on nature. There, there was a story that uh, uh, one religious father told another religious father that he saw his daughter carrying a picnic basket into the woods on Shabbos. And the father of the girl was uh, unfazed. Uh, Mele vajitok darain inwald, as a jit onheben zu togen funwald, das ist ein digreste zore, which is a pun on the word zu togen, which means to carry and to become uh, pregnant. Uh, there were basically two kinds of youth movements in, in Poland. Uh, there were the, uh, what I would call the uh, uh, classical youth movements and then the party youth, youth movements. Now the classical youth movement was a youth movement which saw young people as the leaders, as the avant-garde. Adults have screwed up the world. Adults don't know what they're doing. We young people, we know how to change the world. We're pure. We're idealistic. These classical youth movements derive their inspiration from the German von der Vogel, from the uh, British scouting movement. Uh, it rejected the authority of existing political parties, rejected the authority of the adult world. And the classic example of this kind of a youth movement in Poland was Hashomer Hatzair. Uh, Hashomer Hatzair uh, turned its back on the adult world. It turned its back on the uh, gray reality of Jewish Poland. It held other Zionist parties in contempt. Uh, it wanted to create an uh, exalted individual, an exalted Jew, who would leave Poland and settle in Eretz Yisrael and become a moral model for this wonderful Jewish society that was going to take shape in Eretz Yisrael. In the Hashomer Hatzair, there was a great deal of what we might call psychological policing or psychological education, depending on what you prefer to call it. That is, you were constantly being monitored by the group. There would be discussions about your behavior, the behavior of other members of the group. There would be self-criticism sessions, which often reduce people uh, to tears. Uh, there were the Ten Commandments of Hashomer, no smoking, no drinking, no sex and we can go on and on. The Hashomer became increasingly Marxist, especially in uh, the 1930s. Uh, and uh, it, as Moshe Kligsberg pointed out, it tended to attract kids from better homes economically, kids who tended to speak Polish. The Hashomer held Yiddish in contempt. By and large, its affairs were conducted in Polish but it stressed the importance of acquiring an excellent, excellent knowledge of Hebrew. And the more you were in Hashomer, the more Hebrew you got to know. Hashomer was part of an umbrella organization called Hachalutz, which included other Zionist parties. 
and which sent kids to Hakshara to toughen themselves, to prepare themselves by uh, chopping wood, by working in sawmills, by uh, crushing stones, uh, to uh, leave their families, to leave Poland, and to settle in the land of Israel. An ex an, a youth movement that was the opposite of Hashomer Hatzair in many ways was the Bundist youth movement called Sukkum. Whereas uh, Hashomer Hatzair stressed the uh, leadership of young people and the uh, weakness and fecklessness of the adult world, uh, Sukkum uh, pledged allegiance to the adult party. Uh, Sukkum embraced Yiddish, and Sukkot went out of its way to serve the psychological needs of poor working class Jewish kids, especially in the big cities, who for the most part were not dreaming of hachshara, preparation for a kibbutz. They were not dreaming of going to Palestine. They were trying to cope with the here and now. And as Jack Jacobs points out, one of the reasons why Sukkot became more and more popular, and in fact, by the late 30s, the Bund was the strongest political party on the Jewish street, was that Sukkum really went out of its way to understand the emotional needs of Jewish adolescents, uh, psychological problems, questions of sexuality, issues like women's rights. Uh, no youth movement was more involved in dealing with these issues than was uh, the Tsukum. The tension between generations also extended to religious Jews. There, you might say there were the beginnings of a youth revolt in the Aguda, in the Orthodox religious party, where articles were written by young people saying, why is it that the party automatically listens to the Gvirim, the rich Hasidim, who uh, 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 employ workers at substandard wages, and dictate party policy? Why doesn't the Aguda do more to defend the interests of the poor? And within the Aguda, there were calls for a youth movement that would even promote hachshara, that would promote preparation for emigration to Palestine. As David Fishman points out, a very interesting movement within the Orthodox world, uh, you may or may not call it a youth movement, was the movement uh, of the Musarnikes, uh, who, as if you read the novels of Chaim uh, Grade, uh, had a certain degree of success in recruiting young people, especially in the small towns of eastern Poland, and uh, imbue in them an allegiance to a religious way of life which stressed ethics and which stressed the importance of improving yourself psychologically. It would be tempting to say that the youth movements were an example of what the French called faute de mieux. That is, life was tough, things were hard, and uh, this is a way that people made up for a bad situation. Uh, and obviously, the youth movements could not directly solve that nagging question, was weiter, what's going to happen next? You turn uh, 20. You're in a kibbutz uh, crushing stones or chopping wood in eastern Poland. Uh, no certificates are being handed out to emigrate to Palestine. What do you do next? What's your next step? Uh, at what point do you leave that cocoon of the youth movement and face the hard knocks of adult life? Well, the youth movements, I think, were by and large very successful in giving these young people the psychological wherewithal to deal with the hard knocks that they were going to face. We'll never know what would have happened because everything was cut short by the war. But by all accounts, they really did give, give people a sense of purpose and a sense of hope, a sense that life could be better, and that there were good people out there. And I want to end this by talking about uh, just mentioning, because I don't have the time to really discuss it, 
that when World War II happened, and as the adult political parties collapsed, in Warsaw, for example, uh, most of the leaders of the major Jewish parties ran away, as conditions worsened and worsened, uh, it was the youth movements that became more and more important. They maintained their integrity. The key figures in the youth movements trusted each other, knew each other from years of working together before the war. And by 1942, as the news was coming in of mass uh, murders uh, all over Poland, uh, it was the Hashomer Hatzair and the Dror and uh, Betar, uh, the youth movement of the revisionists, which became increasingly popular in the 1930s, uh, which took the lead in calling for armed resistance. This uh, uh, decision to begin preparations for armed resistance reflected another feature of these Jewish youth movements, uh, which was especially strong in the Zionist youth movements and especially strong in Betar, but also in Hashomer Hatzair which is that the youth movements were a way of taking Polish cultural values, heroism, a determination to fight, physical courage, military bearing, and to channel that in a Jewish direction. And as I said before, the war, you might say, was the crowning achievement of the Jewish youth movements in Poland. Abba Kovner, in the Vilna ghetto, Abrasha Blum of Bunsukumt in the Warsaw ghetto, Mordechai Anilevich of Hashomer Hatzair, Yitzhak Zuckerman of uh, Dror, uh, the courageous fighters of Betar who fought on Muranowska 7, uh, their names are forever associated with the Jewish resistance in World War II. Uh, very few people today are alive who were in those youth movements, but very few people, uh, th those people who still remember them, I would guess, would remember them with a great deal of nostalgia and with a great deal of uh, gratitude. Thank you. We will have a Q&A for a, a bit of time now, but before we start the Q&A, I want to um, thank uh, the people who've made today possible, uh, including our partner, uh, the Center for Jewish History, which was um, uh, essential for uh, today's activities. And I especially want to thank the Evo Archive and the library staff, um, our performers, and uh, Alex Weiser, our program manager, for making this possible. So um, please, um, any questions for Professor Kessel? At, a, at the time when these children are graduating, whatever schooling, around 14 years old, and they can't, the economy is changing and they can't afford to go to a high school or to a whatever the next step is, what's, what was funding these youth movements? Or how were they sustaining themselves? They were funded by uh, dues, paid by the kids. There's a Yivo autobiography where a, kid, where a young man describes how he makes six wotis a week. That is a dollar 20 cents a week. He gives five zwotis to his family, and he keeps one zwoti for himself, and that one zwoti is then divided. He gives 15 uh, 
uh, cents to the youth movement. He, he keeps uh, 20 cents uh, for the movies. He keeps 20 cents uh, for a membership in the library. And the rest, he buys uh, a loaf of bread uh, and he buys some herring. Uh, but the youth movements were funded uh, by the kids themselves. Now, the Jewish schools, which also had a very hard time, to, to an ever greater extent, the Jewish institutions in Poland before the war were helped by, um, by American Jewry and by Jews outside the country. Uh, the Evo, the Tsisho schools, the Tarbot schools, uh, they enjoyed uh, critical support uh, from abroad, although not as much as they needed. Uh, but uh, the youth movements didn't really have that kind of help. Uh, so it really was pull yourself up by the bootstraps and incredible self-sacrifice. And keep in mind that you know every summer they would go to summer camps, they would, uh, they would make a deal with a peasant and they would pitch tents on a peasant's farm uh, and uh, they would uh, camp near a, a river or a, a lake, and they would have campfires, and they would have discussions and seminars. Uh, and this was pretty common to all the youth movements. Uh, but uh, the conditions were very uh, 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 bad. Uh, and again, a, a real issue that they faced was that uh, they really had to function in conditions of real poverty. Um, today, we have the internet. And uh, for the last 30, 40 years, this has influenced the world as it never has before. But then you have Poland in the 1920s and the 1930s. And you talk about promise of Palestine for these young Jews in Poland or Eastern Europe. Uh, the question I'm asking is this. There must have been something bigger, a bigger idea that energized this movement. And my question is, was it only the things that you mentioned, or was it that there was an atmosphere of significant anti-Semitism that was forcing young Jews in the 20s and the 30s to, to create these movements? Well, I did mention that. No, I'm not yeah. questioning yeah. whether you yeah. mentioned it or not, because I'm not smart yeah. enough. I'm just yeah. asking the question. But um, no, you did mention it. But was yeah. there something bigger? That's my question. Well, was there? Yeah, I think. Uh, so, so let me finish. So, yeah. in other words, uh, you have the you have the promise of Palestine. Was did everybody know what was going on in Palestine that they were going to move there? I mean, that's my question. Yeah. Well, yeah. well that's an interesting question. First of all, again, let me say that. Uh, Interest in Zionism, like interest in, say, the Hachalutz, which was the umbrella organization of the Zionist youth movements. So that included Hashomer and Gordonia and Ajor and so on. When, when news from Palestine was okay, then membership would spike. When news from Palestine was bad, then membership would uh, plummet. So uh, in 1928, when more people, when more Jews left Palestine than came into Palestine. And 1928 was a good year economically in the rest of the world, but it was a terrible year in uh, Palestine. Membership in these Zionist youth movements went down. Uh, so Palestine was not the be all and the end all on a mass level, but within the Hashomer Hatzair and within the uh, drawer, within Gordonia, you had a core. Uh, you had a core of true believers who, would, who were just committed and who would wait as long as they had to and do whatever it took. And finally, as the immigration restrictions kicked in after the Arab Revolt of 1936, and uh, by 1937, 38, only 3,000 Jews from Poland a year getting into Palestine, while the natural increase is 40,000, uh, Polish Jewry as a whole tends to move towards the Bund. Uh, the Bund becomes the popular uh, political party in uh, the big cities. In Warsaw, they get 17, 18 out of the 20 Jewish council seats. As you know, the Bund is anti-Zionist. Uh, but that, while that affects 
the mass support for hachalutz among young people. It doesn't affect the true believer support. And then in the late 30s, you begin to have an uptick. Uh, again, we'll never know what would have happened because of the war, but the uptick is caused by a new source of hope, which is illegal emigration. Uh, there's this growing emphasis on illegal uh, emigration. Uh, and then, of course, there's Batar. And Batar is, uh, is a youth movement that's shunned by many others. It's shunned by Hashomer, it's shunned by Dror, it's shunned by the Bund, by Jugend of the Linke Poilitzion, because they were called Jewish fascists, because they liked to march around in military uniforms, because the Polish government looked down them with great sympathy. Uh, when Jabotinsky says a million Jews have to get out of Poland uh, yesterday, uh, the Polish government said, yeah, that, we kind of like that. And, and uh, when and Batar paraded around in, uh, and, and they marched and they stressed discipline and they stressed conquering Palestine on both sides of the Jordan River. So that movement was more popular in the late 30s than it was in the, in the early 30s. But to answer your question, for the most part, by the late 30s, Zionism was, was, uh, was in retreat. And Polish Jewry as a whole was moving towards the Bund. Now, what would have happened in 42 or 43 of the war not started, they might have moved back to Zionism. I mean, Polish Jewry was characterized by these very quick uh, political shifts. Uh, but, uh, when we think of the Zionist youth movements, we think ab about extraordinary people who held them together. Tosia Altman, Mordechai Ani Levitch, Yuda Veng uh, Veng uh, Vengrover, uh, Arya Vilner, uh, Abba Kovner. Uh, we can go on and on. Mordechai Tannenbaum. These were people who were not going to leave their youth movement and become Bundes. Well, there, the, there was no youth movement that specifically uh, was, you know, based on emigration to Argentina. There were youth movements like the Sparberg in uh, the Cresci around Vilna, which were territorialist. That is, they believed that a solution to the Jewish problem was to emigrate to a territory. It could be Guiana it could be New Guinea, it could be Burma, uh, but just uh, uh, that's, a, that's a solution to the Jewish problem. Now, Argentina, as you know, is a great uh, destination of Jewish uh, migration because of Baron de Hirsch, and then for a very long time, the Argentine economy was very attractive, but uh, in the 1930s, there were growing immigration restrictions in uh, Argentina too. Uh, so, again, these youth movements were idealistic, and migrating to Argentina was, was not really idealistic. Uh, it was a practical solution to a practical problem. Uh, getting back to the previous question, uh, I'd like, you know, one of the things I just want to repeat is that Palestine, for these youth movements, with the exception of Betar, uh, was not a goal in and of itself. The goal was a Palestine that would become a model, a paragon of social justice, a model of a society where people would be better, where people would be less selfish, uh, where people would work for the greater good. Now, Batar, uh, which listened to Jabotinsky, uh, uh, rejected what Jabotinsky called shotness. Shotness, which is the mixing of materials that's forbidden by Jewish law, is what Jabotinsky called this artificial mixing of Jewish nationalism and socialism. Uh, it's enough to have a Jewish state in Palestine, that should be our goal, and let's not muddy the waters by trying to mix that with, with, uh, with uh, other uh, ambitions. 
Uh, but most of these youth movements wanted a better world. The Bund, the Linke Pilot Sion, the Zionist youth movements. And that's why when you looked at their reading, when you looked at that reading culture, most of it was, as I said, in non-Jewish literatures, non-Jewish heroes, uh, examples of young people who, who uh, overcome obstacles, uh, who, who turn their backs on those who try to discourage them or try to pour cold water on their hopes and their ideals, who keep on striving. And uh, these were the heroes of the books that Jewish kids loved to read in the 20s and uh, in the 30s. So the youth movements were not, it would be inaccurate to say that they were defined only by Jewish nationalism. Jewish nationalism, be it in its Zionist or in its Bundist uh, 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 iteration, certainly played a, a, a role, but I think except for Bitar, uh, it, it really was a striving for a better world and in the process to solve the Jewish problem. And this was also true of the communists who, I, you know, who were also uh, a major factor on uh, the Jewish street, although we shouldn't tell anybody outside this room. <laughs> I think we have time for one, one last question. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm wondering were the Jewish youth groups in some way a response to the segregation or of, of other groups, like um, the Hitler Youth Group? The what? The Hitler Youth Group, or well, that would be in Germany, but were there groups in, in uh, Poland that kept Jews, Jewish youth out, and so that Hashomer and these other groups were sort of, a, were they a response? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think I said in my talk that uh, on the one hand, this Jewish generation was educated in the Polish language and above all in Polish culture. And it was a culture which, which evoked incredible respect and admiration. This, th th this was the thing. I mean, while, while Jews had been taught for ages to feel superior, to feel that that, that, that they have, that they're members of a wonderful nation, a wonderful tradition. The fact was that this exposure to Polish culture uh, did leave a psychological imprint. On the other hand, uh, Jews were excluded for the most part from the Polish scouting organizations, from the Hartzeja, uh, from the Hartzerstvo, uh, you, you really read very, very few examples in the youth autobiographies of young Jews and young Poles really socializing. Uh, you read it more uh, in, in the memoirs of kids who were in the communist movements, uh, but you don't read it any, uh, uh, anywhere else. So th usually, uh, even in Galicia, even where Jews grew up speaking Polish, even when they were totally uh, acculturated, it seemed that they had few Polish friends. Uh, there were Polish acquaintances, and uh, there were casual friendships, uh, certainly, uh, but even assimilated, acculturated Jews tended to hang out with each other, and this was especially true of young people. In other words, there was more segregation in the late 30s than there was in uh, the 20s. Uh, this was the trend. Uh, in uh, New York, your average middle-class Jewish person is going to read the New York Times, and he might read the Jewish Week for Jewish news once a week. Why was it that Polish Jews needed Nash Pszeglon as a daily newspaper, or the Chvila in Lvov? Uh, why did they need daily newspapers in the Polish language? Uh, why couldn't they read the general Polish press? In part because there was this real gap, and it was a growing gap, uh, between uh, Poles and Polish-speaking Jews. And uh, as many scholars have pointed out, uh, 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 the, th what was happening in the 30s was the development of a new kind of community, a Polish-speaking Jewish community reading Polish reading Jewish newspapers in the Polish language, but which felt itself to be entirely Jewish. May I ask a question? 
Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mentioned uh, uh, Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was in the drawer, which merged with the Freiheit, and the Freiheit and the drawer in turn was, were affiliated with the Rechte Pilot Sion uh, by the late 1930s. Uh, and I write about that quite a bit in my book on Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, and yeah, and the Freiheit was uh, very important, and th there was a big difference in that the Freiheit was was more open to a Yiddish, whereas Hashomer Hatzair was less open to Yiddish. Uh, you know, you just can't say everything in uh, 30 minutes. But uh, you're right. You, you're right. Yeah. 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 I actually like the Freiheit. In fact, they're my favorite youth movement. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, ha we, we could oh, keep okay. going. Absolutely, yeah. but we do have to stop. Thank you so much, Sam. Our next, um, our next speakers are uh, Miriam Udell and Naomi Seidman, and um, please come up. Hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's not my. Oh, are you next? That's you. So uh, thank you so much to Jonathan Brent and to Alex Weiser for the invitation to come and appear with my venerable colleagues who are also studying uh, Jewish children and children's culture. I begin by quoting the contemporary American children's author Jane Yolen, renowned as the author of How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? Maybe among this crowd, her more relevant claim to fame is as the author of How Did Dinosaurs Say Happy Hanukkah? Children know themselves to be the single most powerless unit in today's world, Yolen writes. They cannot support themselves. They cannot vote. They have little physical strength. They have but a small knowledge of the universe. They cannot see over walls. As infants, they are entirely dependent upon the kindness of adults, and as they grow up further, they are still small satellites in an adult world. They dream of being big enough and old enough and able enough to tame the wild things. In reality, those wild things could well devour them. Therefore, we give them many tools with which to keep the real world at bay until they are ready for it. We give them teachers, we give them toys, we give them chants and prayers and cultural attitudes and surround them with tribes and tribal constraints. We give them stories. Yolen's psychological aesthetic theory of children's literature is built on the assumption of children's essential powerlessness. To her way of thinking, 
Children Figure, as the title of an anthology published in 1920 by Leah Kapilowitz Hoffman styles them as Kleine in der Größer Welt. While acknowledging the singular vulnerabilities of children's status, however, I come at the question from, from an opposing vantage point and argue that the rise of Yiddish children's literature in the 1920s and 30s was predicated on an appeal to children by Yiddish writers and cultural leaders as the repository of a great deal of latent but soon to be actualized power in the form of social, cultural, and political capital. The study of Yiddish children's literature with which I am engaged affords a new lens through which to examine the defining crises of the interwar period for Jewry in Eastern Europe and the far-flung Yiddish-speaking diaspora of the Americas. Writing for children necessarily stakes claims on a vision for the future. Surely it is no accident that a vibrant Yiddish literary youth culture arose at a moment of bracing ideological ferment, when socialism, social, Soviet communism, and Zionism, all of which were alluded to in, in Professor Kazov's presentation, all appeared as compelling, plausible potentialities for Jewish communal expression and actualization. These movements were the ideological manifestations of such underlying phenomena as secularization, urbanization, mass migration, and the articulation of national identity. Children's literature was also a hospitable arena for politically tendentious writing. Whereas an overtly ideological plot line or narrative voice might be off-putting to sophisticated adult readers, especially during the high watermark of literary modernism, a surface level simplicity was not only acceptable, but considered a virtue when addressing a juvenile audience. Today's talk will explore a selection of stories composed for children and published throughout the interwar period by two authors who shared a simpatico progressive ideological vision, but who found themselves in very different circumstances from one another. Writing and publishing in the Soviet Union, Leib Kvitko wrote in a variety of genres and moods, but always reinforced the centrality of the revolution and its values while Gershon Einbinder, writing under the pen name of Haver Paver, emigrated to Los Angeles and published in New York, most notably two volumes of stories about a precocious canine, Labzik, the affable left-wing family that had the good fortune to adopt him, and eventually Labzik's mezunical Vovik. Both of these authors tend toward mimetic realism, in contrast to the romanticizing folkloric predilections of much Yiddish children's literature of the period. And they are frank about their political aspirations. Indeed, the crystallization of realism into socialist realism is a major topic in the scholarly discourse about Soviet children's literature, both Yiddish and Russian. But an important difference between these two authors emerges with respect to the locus of identity formation. The human and canine members of Haver Paver's exemplary and highly conventional nexus of father, mother, brother, sister, dog, experience the world and absorb its lessons precisely through the medium of family with its hierarchical but cooperative gender and generational power dynamics. Kvitko, on the other hand, sketches portraits of children with absent or deficient parents. Juveniles must overcome or compensate for parental incompetence. Youth leads the way forward and receives all that is necessary in the way of care and modeling through the medium of the state. When I began working with this material, I expected to be able to clearly differentiate between the communism of Kvitko and the socialism of Einbinder, whom I expected to be a bit softer and less pointed in his call for a disruption of the reigning capitalist order. What I have found, however, is a tonal contrast rather than a sharp ideological one. Despite similar politics and authorial attitudes, the Lebenslage simply unfolded differently in 1930s New York than in 1930s Moscow or Kharkov. 
Taking advantage of the prophecy of hindsight, we might hazard the inference that the tonal disparities between these two authors' work foreshadow the difference between death by firing squad on the night of the murdered poets and death from natural causes in Los Angeles in the mid-60s. Leib Kvitko was among the most prolific Yiddish children's authors in the Soviet Union, and his work was surely the most widely disseminated. Born in 1890 or 1893, the details are a little fuzzy, in Holoskova, near Odessa, he lost both of his parents at a young age and was raised by his grandmother. He seems to have retained some warm feelings for his hometown as he dedicated the 1927 verse story Berchik to the Holoskover Shul, despite, or perhaps because of, a working class childhood he harbored literary aspirations that were dampened, but not squelched, by the rejection of his early poetry by the critic Shmuel Niger. He was encouraged to persevere, however, by David Bergelson, who arranged a sort of GED for him, private lessons in general subjects and languages. In 1917, Kvitko arrived in Kiev wearing a homemade coat, hat, and boots and was welcomed by the urban literary community as a folk talent. He married in 1918 and settled in Kiev, where he worked as a courier and later as a teacher at a Jewish orphanage. Following his book Lidelech, Poems for Little Children in 1917, three more collections of his children's poems were published in Kiev between 1918 and 1920. Meanwhile, Kvitko became part of the Kulturliga literary circle and published modernist and folk poetry. During the early 20s, he spent time living in Kovne, Berlin, and Hamburg, while his poems appeared in periodicals based in Berlin, Moscow, and New York. Having joined the Communist Party in Germany, Kvitko hurried back to Soviet Russia in 1925, fearing that the German police would arrest him for his political activities. He was offered the editorship of a journal in Kharkov and was championed as a children's author by the leading Russian children's writer, Kornei Shukhovsky, whose support helped to ensure that his works in Russian and Ukrainian translation would enjoy print runs in the millions. Kvitko was covered with official honors throughout the 30s, but none of his acclaim could ultimately prevent his liquidation at Stalin's behest, along with other members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, the JAC, on August 12, 1952. Needless to say, the Stalin who ordered the murder of Jewish poets, novelists, and activists would have been unrecognizable to the author of the 1940 picture book, Vemis is Ismaidele, Whose Little Girl Is This? Published in Moscow by Melucha Farlag, Der Emes, the story had a print run of 10,000, one of Kvitko's largest in Yiddish. Kvitko wrote mostly in verse, but this is one of a few works where he alternates between rhyming verse and prose. A rhyming frontispiece describes the Maidele and Embloim Kleidele, who is ready to chase butterflies in the country orchard. The prose explains that she is transfixed by the crowds of, da of Dasha-bound mothers and children in the train station, and in the commotion is separated from her own mother, who mistakes another little girl for hers and hustles her onto the carriage by the shoulders, leaving her own daughter behind. At first, the abandoned girl is so paralyzed with fear that she can neither move nor speak, despite the best efforts of the passers-by to identify and care for her. She grows increasingly upset until she's on the verge of tears, longing for a familiar face. Just then, she spots one. Here was one of her own, a friend of many years. It's so very unexpected when someone like that appears. The onlookers follow her joyful gaze, to the portrait of Stalin hanging between two windows in the station, toward which the girl now makes her way. She has located a paternal presence to substitute for the missing maternal one. Having taken courage from the reassuringly familiar face, at last she is ready to address the gathered crowd, which she does with confidence and precocity. Maya Volokova, Drayor Dosferte, Kirov Gas 78, Quartier 9. She charms the onlookers, all of whom rush to aid and engage her in various ways. 
und das Mädel ist so lacht und das Mädel ist erscheint, leben größen Kinderfreund. A girl that shines with laughter, nary a care, near the great friend of children everywhere. Just at this happy climax, Maya's mother comes back to claim her. Parenthetically, I'll add, there is no mention of what happened to the child that her mother took by accident. <laughs> Other Kvitko books and poems praise Soviet heroes. Lenin is the referent of the paraphrastic title Der Schenster Nomen, while the narrator protagonist of Ach, as ich so aufwachsen, oh, when I grow up, wishes to join Semyon Budyoni's Red Cavalry when he grows up. But published in the relatively late year of 1940, and unique in its celebration of a still living political leader, Vemesis Ismaidele seems to be the author's fawning attempt to curry favor or to protect himself from the wrathful, real-life discipline of the benignantly imagined Papa Stalin. After all, the dominant emotions depicted in the book are fear and relief, a familiar enough landscape from fairy tales, but an unsettling palette in a book as mimetically drawn as this one. Even in a story so non-mimetic, so diegetic that the characters are animals, Kvitko embeds a clueless parent and a family that can be saved only through the clever initiative of one of the children. And before I go there, I just want to point out what a friend to children Stalin was depicted as. This is a, a typical piece of propaganda art. Yeah. Um. The family unit is strong enough at the beginning of a tzig mit sieben a nanny goat with seven kids. Once upon a time, in a clearing in the wood, lived a billy goat and a nanny goat with all that was good. Their home was happy, its own little heaven, and as for kids, they had seven. Six of their kitties were healthy, athletic, but the seventh one was truly pathetic. Even the physically weak kid has compensatory strengths. His ribs poked out like needles, and what's more, he limped on one foot. But where he could be, he was the best more clever and cheerful than all the rest. In short order, though, the nanny goat is widowed and must leave her children to forage for food. She leaves her latchkey kids with a strict admonition to open the door only for her, and they begin to look forward to the sing-song she belts out upon returning each day. But a bear is lurking nearby, and he quickly masters the song. The first time the bear tries to pass himself off as their mother, the clever but lame kid prevails on his siblings not to open up for the hoarse, presumably masculine voice that sings to them. The second time, however, the ursine predator has disguised his voice, and the kids are tired anyway of listening to their scolding know-it-all brother. Once they admit the bear, he scoops up six of the seven kids and promises to return and snatch the seventh, the cripple. The lame kid follows at a safe distance and discerns the location of the lair. When his mother returns home, she's devastated at the loss of her kids. Her young son entreats her to stop crying and instead lay a trap for the bear. By doing so, she's able to rescue her other children. The parent provides the muscle, but the wise child provides the brains to save the day. Consider one more story in which the parents are conspicuously absent and agents of the state act in their place. Boots and the Sanitaren, Boots and the Bathmen, is a rather surreal yet somehow charming story about a gluttonous boy who refuses to bathe. His Jewish identity is marked only by the fact that he lives in the shtetl. We hear about his unrestrained love of his favorite sweets, and then onto the scene burst a detachment of three sanitaren, sanitation agents, or bathmen. Here's Boots, who are tasked with forcibly bathing this, this recalcitrant youth. 
Their mandate seems to stem from the combination of germ theory with a muted but unmistakable dirt libel against the Jews. As their leader announces, Tut sanitar a zing via trometo, der kater gate um in stetel, as a jung, as a schlung, as a brud, as a schmutz, nemt him dem boots, schlept him in vanen, los daf him up die kranen. The bathman sings out like a trumpet. A cold is going around the shtetl. Such a youth, such a gullet, such filth, such dirt. Take him that boots, drag him to the bathtub, turn on the taps. His henchmen are intimidating, preternaturally elongated figures in the illustrations by Boris Friedkin. And they swiftly set about extirpating the filth that seems to come of being a gluttonous, shtetl-dwelling Jewish boy. Although the forcible bathing is by turns traumatic and comical, Boots' socks are so caked onto his feet that they cannot be removed before the bath, but must instead be left to float to the surface. I'll show you that illustration. The boy comes to appreciate his new state of cleanliness. Once clean and dry, he manfully shakes the hand of his smock-clad oppressor. When they brought him out of the tub, he burst out laughing with pride. He didn't recognize himself. Absent parental interference, the state effects a transformation of the dirty little Jew so thorough as to render him unrecognizable even to himself. And notice this is another illustration with uh, the sinuous lines of, of Boris Friedkin, this illustrator. Now we pass from Soviet cleanliness to the more familiar squalor of the New York subway system. And in so doing, from the USSR to the US of A, to examine some of the Labzik stories authored by Gershon Einbinder, better known as Khaver Paver. A native of Bershad, Bessarabia, he emigrated to this country in 1924 at the age of 23. He worked as a teacher in the Yiddish schools and contributed regularly to the Freiheit. He lived in the bustling New York imprinted on these stories and then moved to Los Angeles where he wrote a bit for Hollywood, a film based on Mendele's Fischke der Krumer, Fischke the Lame, and another called The Jester, as well as continuing to write for adults and children in Yiddish. The only work of his to be translated into English thus far is his collection of short stories, Clinton Street. Labzik, published in 1935, was distributed through the Yiddish shulas of the International Workers' Order, the most communist aligned of the four secular Yiddish school systems functioning in New York, and its proletarian sympathies are vividly clear. Let's move this over again. By the way, Labzik possesses the additional advantage of being illustrated with the confident and economical line of Lou Boonin. If you don't know his work, including his psychedelic animation of Alice in Wonderland, it's more than worth it to ois googlin. When we meet Labzik, he's cowering on the platform of an elevated train station in the Bronx, where he's been abandoned by a well-meaning but impoverished owner who explains that she has even had to send her own daughter to live with relatives in Boston due to her husband's unemployment in the Great Depression. His whimpering attracts the attention of kindly Beryl der Operator, who decides to take a chance and delight his son Mulek and daughter Rivka with the gift of a dog. The family is sketched rapidly in stereotypes. Beryl is gruff, but has reassuringly merry black eyes. He punctuates his speech with the mild curse, a capore, which seems to alternately signify, oh, blast it, or golly, what's the use? 
His wife, Molly, is forbearing and cheerful. She manages the household, coming to terms with their border and holding the family to standards of decent behavior, like making Beryl greet her and the children properly on the night when he is sulkingly preoccupied by an impending strike. Rifkele, the daughter, is all sweetness and affection, especially where it concerns Labzik, whom she cuddles like a baby doll and gently chastises when he does some bit of harmless mischief. Mulik is brave and decent, selflessly leading a strike on behalf of his hungry schoolmates, who are ethnic Polish Americans. He is also close friends with Noyech, the only black boy on the block. Taken together, they seem like a sitcom family, and maybe had their comic tribulations taken place two decades later, and in the English language, they might have been. With the stories structured episodically, you can almost hear the laugh track punctuating Labzik's antics. The action rises to a conflict in each chapter and is resolved by chapter's end, often through the interference or intervention of Labzik, despite his limited repertoire of activities and expressions. Even so, the themes are anything but lighthearted. Indeed, Einbinder manifests political commitments similar to Kvitko's. Let's talk about a few seminal episodes. Recent events have foregrounded those involving relations with the police and interracial friendships, both of which are prominently portrayed in the Labzik stories. The family inhabits a milieu thick with socialist and communist youth culture. The children attend public school each morning and then a secular Yiddish shule in the afternoon where the Internationale is sung and various political causes are highlighted. Brother and sister head to the intersection near the train station one afternoon to collect funds for the benefit of Ernst Tellmann, the Weimar-era leader of the German Communist Party who was held in solitary confinement for 11 years before being executed at Buchenwald. Indeed, the main youth group in East Germany after World War II was known as the Tellmann Pioneers. A policeman tries to arrest Mulik, Rifkele, and Labzik, but as he holds the kicking, struggling kids and the dog by their collars, a crowd of workers gathers and demands to know what's going on. After being told it's none of their business, the workers reply, Es ist jo unser Geschäft. Was hofft du die kleine Kinder? Und was bringst du in Beucherei in dem schönen Hinterle? Ruft sich an Mulik, er schleppt uns in Turme, weil wir sammeln Geld zu Rate von Tellmannen, weil der Polizmann ist für die Reiche. Tellmann machen die Arbeiter unser Haver Tellmannen? Ey, du Paskudner Kap! Ey, du Azoiner und Azoiner! Yes, it's our business. What have you got against these little kids? And why are you kicking this nice doggy in the stomach? Mulek called out, he's taking us to jail because we're collecting money to save Telman, because the policeman's on the side of the rich. Telman, says the workers, our friend Telman? Oh, you lousy cop, you little such and such. Telman is not the only foreign communist hero to whom Beryl and Molly's children feel an allegiance. Mulek proudly surprises Rivka and Labzik with a new poster, a portrait of Lenin. The children decide to fix up a Lenin winkel in their room. According to Elisa Benporat's rich and engagingly written study of Minsk, Becoming Soviet Jews, the Young Pioneer's Handbook stated that every pioneer would set up an atheist corner at home with anti-religious pictures, poems, and sayings as a counterpoint to the Russian Orthodox tradition of maintaining in-home icon corners. Generally, the way the stories work is that Labzik engages in some minor act of mischief, either with or without the initial approbation of his family. When Mulik organizes a children's strike to demand meals for all of the children, Labzik delivers contraband pamphlets. He's threatened with arrest by the animal control agent until the children ring the animal control wagon and stage a sit-in, allowing the dog to escape. The children's strike is but a pale imitation of the real thing, recounted in what is perhaps the book's darkest chapter. Bettel's boss extends the workday to 9 p.m., prompting the workers to strike. But there are eight holdouts in the shop on, the on 34th Street. Bettel climbs up 18 flights of stairs to persuade the holdouts to join the strike. The bosses have him jumped by goons, identified in the Yiddish text as gangsters tied up and thrown behind a locked door on the roof of the building. 
Labzik, who has snuck along for the adventure against the wishes of his family, finds Betel and summons help. The strike prevails. In addition to his pure charm value, the canine protagonist allows Einbinder to have it both ways. On one hand, Labzik displays preternatural intelligence, but on the other, a dog is just a dog, unintelligent, unenlightened, and literally inhuman when it comes to the scourge of racism. Labzik, following some mysterious instinct, bites Mulik's friend Noyach on the leg, only to have Mulik punish him with 10 lashes. But there's a worse punishment in store for him. Ever ready to imitate the adults, Mulik and his friend Jaime, who calls Labzik a weiser chauvinist, or a racist, a white chauvinist, convene a trial before all the other kids from the block. They determine that Labzik must be ostracized for a full week for his crime. This is so hard on the social animal that after a few days, he says he would prefer drowning in a river. But when the week is up, Labzik has learned his lesson. He wouldn't bite a black child who'd done nothing to him, even for a whole house full of lemchops. And as Einbinder has designed it, the Yiddish-speaking children from the block, as they grow into their latent social power, have learned their lesson too. Politically progressive, racially enlightened, these are the values that Einbinder puts forward as both Jewish and American values seamlessly joined. And the place where those values are both modeled and discussed is the home of the Jewish worker. The functional, involved family, in contrast to Kvitko's absent or dysfunctional one, provides the site where identity is formed. Thank you. Sorry about this, guys. I don't, I don't even quite know how this computer works. Um, do, would you mind helping me, Miriam? X, uh, I, I just don't know where the, it's not. We might, how does that work? We might need Alex. Oh, Is there somebody here who knows how this works? See, will that help? No, oh, we could just escape. Oh, yeah, hi, Alex, the thank you. I just don't, how does that work? I don't even see the cursor. We need some young people here. Okay. Oh, there you go, Alex. Okay. Is that a cursor? It doesn't seem to be working. No. Hmm. Sorry, everybody. In the meantime, I'll just say how honored I am to be here on this very distinguished panel. Um, and how great it was to see the happenings this morning, just for a little bit, and how great it is to be spending the year at the Center for Jewish History. Maybe I'll also say that my name is Naomi Seidman. <laughs> ah, yeah, and here's my PowerPoint. But where is it on the screen? There you go. Thank you. That childhood is not a universal, by the way, this thing seems as if I, I could barely see Miriam, so maybe I should, maybe I should try to stand here, is that better? How's that? So that childhood is not a universal, unchanging feature of all human societies, but rather that it has a history, is the founding insight of Philippe Ariès enormously influential 1960s study, Centuries of Childhood. Ariès's argument was that before the 18th century, childhood as we now understand it simply didn't exist. Child rearing, given pre-modern rates of infant mortality, was less sentimental, more detached. Children in traditional societies were seen and depicted as basically tiny adults. The modern idea of childhood, with all its sentiments, assumptions, practices, was basically an invention of the 18th century. 
Ariezo also claims that the notion of adolescence as ad of adolescence as a distinct life stage separating childhood and adulthood was an even later development and one that emerged with revolutionary speed. Over the course of a few decades, in the middle of the 19th century, European society passed from essentially having no conception of adolescence, no words to describe this life stage or what made it unique, to constructing an entire discourse around those years. Since then, Arias argues, adolescence has become the most fascinating, noteworthy life stage of them all. Summarizing the cultural consensus of what adolescence now looks like, Arias writes, the first typical adolescent of modern times was Wagner Siegfried. The music of Siegfried expressed for the first time that combination of provisional purity, physical strength, naturism, spontaneity, and joie de vivre, which was to make the adolescent the hero of the 20th century, the century of adolescence. Jewish study scholars, along with the historians of many other societies, borrowed Ariez's fundamental insight that childhood has a history, even while taking issue with his most provocative claims. By now, historians of, ch of childhood have more or less rejected the notion that parents and societies with high rates of, ch of childhood death were any less attached to their children than modern and contemporary parents. But for Jewish studies, the history of childhood takes on a double character. On the one hand, Jewish historians, like those of other societies, study the way that conceptions and realities of Jewish childhood and youth have changed over time. But they also ask an additional set of questions. Do Jewish societies share conceptions of childhood and adolescence with their neighbors, or did they develop distinct views and patterns on this matter? For instance, did adolescence, however it was conceived, begin earlier or later for Jews than for their neighbors? And to bring this question home to our own topic, did Eastern European Jewish society develop a notion of adolescence that was distinct from that of other, Jewish, of that of other European cultures? Were Jewish adolescents also Siegfrieds, who embodied that combination of purity, strength, naturism, spontaneity, spontaneity, et cetera, that made the adolescent the hero of the 20th century. In fact, the field of Jewish childhood often takes as its starting point the need to counter Ariez's influential narrative, recognizing Jewish sources as telling a different story than the one he traced for Europe. David Kramer suggests that rabbinic literature, contra Ariez, was fully aware of what he called the developmental continuity of childhood, not only putting children and adults into separate halachic categories, but also recognizing much finer distinctions between three-year-olds and five-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 18-year-olds. The rabbis did not consider that adulthood began at puberty, the onset of sexual maturity. For rabbinic literature, um, that uh, adolescence inaugurated a lim uh, uh, puberty inaugurated a liminal period of energy and irresponsibility, sexual desire with no normative outlet, since the rabbis also thought that the ideal age for marriage was 18 or 20. To move closer to our own topic, Gershon Hundert, noting that the 18th century demographic explosion among Ashkenazic Jewry meant that there were lots of young people around, suggested that long before the rise of youth movements, traditional Jewish society was essentially a youth culture. This explains a whole host of, the, of phenomena, including lots of rabbinic writing on the question of masturbation, and the rabbinic rise, the big, the, I'm sorry, the rapid spread of Hasidism. Um, Hasidism, Hunter points out, was characterized initially by a mocking attitude toward the learned, energetic dancing, singing and drinking, turning somersaults in the street, and so on. The Hasidic movement, Hundert suggests, 
was thus not so much a class or not only a class phenomenon, it was also a generational phenomenon. Given the explosion in the number of young people, it's no surprise that 18th century rabbis carefully delineated a wide range of rules regarding adolescence. For instance, business contracts were valid only if they were signed by someone who had reached the age of 20. Despite the basic recognition of a life stage that separated puberty from adulthood, and despite an implicit consensus of what characterized this life stage, irresponsibility, enthusiasm, masturbation, there can be no doubt that a new and distinct approach to adolescence was a highly visible feature of interwar Polish Jewish society. And I'll skip my next paragraph because, Dave, uh, because Sam Kassow did such an excellent job summarizing that. And I'll just ask the question of, did something distinguish the Jewish expression of what was in many regards an international phenomenon? And obviously there are many answers to, possible to this question, but I'll just suggest one here, which is that youth culture overtook a society that already had a very well-developed popular literature on the question of Jewish childhood and youth. From this perspective, Jews underwent the changes that Arias traces throughout Europe, not naturally or unknowingly, almost without noticing, but with a very particular self-consciousness, as if every writer, every teenager, were a historian and theorist of Jewish childhood, a Philippe Ariès in amateur Jewish form. Beginning with Salman Maimon's, uh-oh, do I not have, I'm sorry, these got slightly out of order. Here's Salman Maimon. Um, or maybe that illustrates the previous, uh, sorry, here's, uh, well, there's uh, Jabotinsky and some members of Beitar, and that's, I think, Hashem Arat Sa'ir on the left. Forgot to advance, oh, that was the slot, that was what I was gonna illustrate the last paragraph with, sorry about that. So, beginning with Maimon, continuing in many 19th century autobiographies, Jewish writings team with anguished laments about the way that Jewish traditional life robbed young people of their youth, subjecting boys to long hours over the Talmud, marrying them off too early, burdening them with families before they could experience themselves as independent individuals, depriving them of youthful adventure in the name of responsibility to family and community. The Hebrew poet Chaim Nachman Bialik was far from alone in writing, they say that there is youth in the world, but where's my youth? Jewish life in this literary trope is the very opposite of youth, functioning as a mechanism to deny young Jews those experiences and qualities that the young people of other nations, at least in these people's imagination, consider their birthright, the natural essential characteristics of being young. To be Jewish in this sense is to be already old. Within this context, modernization was conceptualized and marketed as fundamentally a right to youth, a way of overthrowing the regime that had made Jewish youth so devoid of the pleasures and energies that other young people experienced. This revolution was finally accomplished in the interwar period, and youth became a central defining feature of Jewish life, even in traditional Orthodox circles. The organized Orthodox world, far from resisting the newfangled emphasis on youth, embraced the larger discourse that celebrated youthful energy, founding its own youth movements that paralleled those of the secular world. In one speech to the Orthodox girls' movement, Benos, this is all Benos Besyakov pictures, Sarah Schneerer, the founder of Besyakov, exhorted the members to remember that youth means happiness, courage, optimism, and faith in ancient ideals. Pessimism, doubt, sadness is anti-youth. Youth means enthusiasm, living, striving, our youth movement must have life. Even orthodoxy took part in the exaltation of youth that Ariès describes as a central feature of 20th century life, harnessing the energies of the young people it was praising for the ideological purpose of reinvigorating ancient ideals. 
To be Jewish in this brave new world was to be young, and the old contradictions between Jewishness and youth, it was fervently hoped, could be laid to rest. It's striking then that despite this robust, robust, diverse, ramified youth culture, the notion that Jewishness basically was a synonym for old age did not entirely dissipate even among young people who were fully engaged with youth culture. The youth autobiographies collected in the 1930s did not spell the end of a literary tradition that figured Jewishness as robbing young people of their youth. It was just another chapter in this old story, in some say, sense made more painful by the celebrations of youth all around them. The writings and drawings of the autobiographies expose the gap between the public idealization of youthful joy, freedom, and energy, and the realities of the lives of many young people. The truth was that despite the, young, the youth movements and sporting clubs, Jewish experience continued to be different, and the long tradition of self-reflection on Jewish difference and on the gap between ideals and realities persisted even after Jews borrowed the outward forms of European youth culture. In the time that re remains, I'd like to reflect on how this difference manifested itself, not so much in the youth culture of the period as in the academic research on Jewish youth that emerged in the 1930s, particularly in the 1935 study by Max Weinreich that Sam already mentioned, Der Weg zu unserer Jugend. With the research of you know, many people, including Barbara kirschenbach Gimlet and other people, Cecile Kuznets, Kamil Kiak, we now understand that the youth research program of YIVO was more than a strictly scholarly attempt to bring the sophisticated methodology of the American social sciences to the study of Eastern European Jewry. It was also an ideological and political enterprise which aimed to solidify Jewish life in Poland by attending to the problems of Jewish youth and by bringing Jewish youth into the orbit of YIVO. In this sense, the YUKFOR, the uh, youth research program, fully fit into the highly politicized youth culture of the 1930s, mobilizing scholarship for the purposes of uh, strengthening the YIVO's brand of Yiddishism and Deutkeit, and with it, Polish Jewish society. Um, and I'm not denying the persuasiveness of this reading, but there's something about the book that I would, I want to focus on now, which it's rather eccentric style, um, which, of, of Weinrath's work. Far from speaking with the assured authority of an ideologue, which he certainly was, the Weg zu unserer Jugend is structured as a set of unanswered questions, hesitations, admissions of epistemological uncertainty. The reader comes away from Weinrath's work not with a sure sense of what constitutes the character of Polish Jewish youth, but rather with a sense of the impossibility of no, knowing almost anything on the topic with any certainty. While Ariès suggests that once adolescence was invented, the notion of what constituted the state of being rapidly became widely understood, Weinreich begins and ends by suggesting that adolescence is the dark continent of Jewish knowledge, a stage of life that presents not only the average parent, but also the serious researcher with a series of extraordinarily, extraordinary challenges. Despite its political engagement, and despite the fact that he himself was the leader of a, a founder of a youth movement, Weinrath's study of Jewish youth doesn't take the usual route of many writers of his period and our own, whereby writers consider their job done when, after they've cataloged and detailed the various youth movements and school systems and sport teams of various ideological stripes, which is what a lot of the work looks like. Um, which isn't to say that we don't totally appreciate Sam for doing that and a whole lot more. Um, when he does mention that one or another of the young people he's describing belong to this or that youth, uh, political movement, he does so only to stress that this affiliation should not be understood as allegiance to any explicit ideology. One person joins the Communist Party or some other party because she's full of frustration and hostility. Another one because he's a masochist. One is rebelling against her parents, while another happens to have fallen in love with someone they met at one of the meetings. 
nor does Weinreich champion youth as being idealistic, full of energy, enthusiasm, the hope for the future, or all those familiar cliches. His book begins, in fact, by citing the general dissatisfaction of the adults around him with the young people they know. They lack idealism, or they have idealism, idealism of the wrong sort. Um, der, die der wachsene Welt ist voll mit Teines zum jungen Dorf. That's the first sentence of the book. If Weinrach deviates from the ideological strategy that recruits young people by praising them, he also fails to take the usual position of sociologists as the ostensibly neutral experts on the subject at hand. Even his title, The Way to Our Youth, hints at this difference. While employing the methods of social science, Weinrach doesn't mask his own investment in the issue. These are our youth. But neither does he minimize the distance that separates him as an adult from the young people he hopes to count as his. Weinrach frames his research with an almost exaggerated insistence on the epistemological gap between adulthood and youth, researcher and research subject. And I shortened this paper just in the last couple of minutes because I know we're running short of time. So I had a whole other section that was about the linguistic gap between the terms that Yiddish had and what he needed sociologically. So if that comes up, um, he had to invent the whole vocabulary. There's no word for bu puberty or infancy even. I feel a shaft. Um, he writes, every generation, every culture has a generation gap that separates young people from old people. But nowhere is this abyss more pronounced than among Jews. And uh, I think uh, Sam Kassel also touched on this. The result is a particularly marked incomprehension between the generations. Young people don't understand adults. Adults are baffled by young people. Wherever you look, Weinreich writes, there are conflicts if the parents are conservative and anxious doubts if the parents try to act in the spirit of the times. For every kind of parents, the old rules and even what were once considered established facts no longer hold. And here we'll hearken back to the 18th century with its uh, uh, obsession with masturbation. Once people knew as a fact, that masturbation was a shameful and uh, you know, dangerous act, and parents strove to root out this Jugendsinn in their children. Whether it ever worked or not is a different question. That's him, not me, by the way. But now every parent knows that all children suffer from this disease, and the best thing to do is just pretend you don't notice. Look the other way. If parents are confused about what to do, young people are equally in the dark, torn between crushing self-doubt and feelings of exaggerated grandiosity. Weinrich suggests that this confusing mixture is both a general feature of adolescence and has a specifically Jewish character for the youth of his day. Given the double trauma of a rapidly increasing anti-Semitism and the breakdown of traditional cultural mechanisms for dealing with this trauma. And I should just say that I'm gonna to try to summarize this. This is what most people have noticed is the most original, fascinating contribution of Weinrach's work. Um, the idea that Jewish adolescence is not only about the question of ind individuation, the separation from the family, um, but also a certain kind of individuation that has to take place within the conditions of a denigrated minority. And this is where he talks about uh, the Jewish selfhood beginning with a kind of shock. That Jewishness and, and uh, the shock of, he calls it the first attack and the second attack of Yiddishkeit. Uh, the first one is when you first realize that you're Jewish and he says most of the, this happens in childhood and it's repressed mostly. And the second shock of, uh, of recognizing yourself as a, as, a, as, as a member of a denigrated minority um, uh, and having to um, overcome this shock, integrate the personality as a kind of feature of becoming a Jewish adult. And here are my, he, this, a lot of these, despite the fact that this is a real original contribution, 
He basically got it from the work, uh, from the research trip he took to the Tuskegee Institute in the winter of 32, 33, his interviews with Afri African American youth who also described blackness not as, it's interesting to say it about Jewishness, not as an intrinsic character of the self, but as a blow from the outside. The first time you look in someone's face and they, you, they, you see that they see you as something different and less worthy. Um, and he specifically seems to have, according to Jennifer Young, specifically seems to have really borrowed a lot from um, W.E.B. Du Bois's work, The Souls of Black Folk, when he talks about the double consciousness of African Americans. And I'll just read a little bit. I can't summarize this. It's a peculiar, and Du Bois talks about the first time some little kid doesn't want to play with him because he's black, and, and him seeing himself in her eyes. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on with contempt and pity. One, one always feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unrecon unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Um, Jewishness for Weinreich was also not an intrinsic quality, despite the fact of how deep it went. He talks about the habitus. It's not just, Jewishness is, su is difference right from the start. It's difference in the womb. It's difference in the way the mother holds a child. It's difference in the body knowledge of knowing which neighborhoods in a town you can walk in and which you shouldn't. Um, but it's not difference that's external, it's in, internal. It's difference that's external and that has to be integrated um, with the internal self. And um, you just read, and, and in many ways he says they're, they're, the, the, the path, the healthiest way of confronting the blow of anti-Semitism is through acceptance and integration of Jewish difference rather than the dysfunctional paths of denial autism Weinreich uses the term autism a few years before I've read it appears as a, as a sociological category and fragmentation. And here he's very clearly echoing Du Bois who wrote, the history of the American Negro is the history of strife, the longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. Um, Weinreich's work on Jewish youth is remarkable not only for the insights it provides into the challenges facing a generation of Jews coming of age in 1930s Poland. It's remarkable as well for its epistemological stance, for the methods it mobilized in undertaking in this study, which also it had in common with other sociological studies to some extent. Weinreich's hesitations and circumlocutions, his refusal to draw a political map of Jewish youth, his continual insistence that he could only hazard a guess on this or that issue, is testimony to the novelty of his sociological research, the inevitable uncertainties that were part of being a pioneer in the sociological analysis of Polish Jewish adolescence, itself a new category. But it's also a strategic position and at its best, an ethical stance. Weinreich could hardly do without the ostensibly neutral term Jew, primary descriptor of the population he was studying. He acknowledged that effects of a Jewish upbringing were profound. But he also insisted that individuals could never be reduced to their cult cult their, this cultural context. A yachid is nicht nur a transportwegele, for collective culture. Um, in this way, Weinreich um, allied the research of the sociologist with the psychic development of the adolescent, who also worked to differentiate herself, to individuate herself from family and collective. The youth movements to which Jewish youth belonged could never presume to exhaust the experiences of individuals, just as the traumatized margins of Polish society to which anti-Semitism relegated young Jews could never be given the last word in determining who they were. In a world that was so shaped by collectivity in both negative and positive form, even a collective analysis of Jewish youth must resist the imposition that was collectivity, 
and Jewishness. The world might immediately identify a young person as a Jew, but Weinreich, sociologist of this world, could avoid participating in this toxic game. The use of youth autobiographies was no doubt part of this radical sociology, and in this way, Weinreich's research was a displacement into another field of the radical pedagogy of interwar Poland, which similarly asserted the rights of young people to speak for themselves. In the, if this epistemological gap is a feature of, as a prominent feature of the introduction to the book, um, this dimension of Weinreich's work is evident on nearly every page in the footnotes that refer to the autobiographies that were the primary sources for his analysis. Der Weg zu unserer Jugend, in fact, ends on this note. Weinreich includes a series of appendices with the last one on the question of the sex lives of Jewish youth. That appendix acknowledges at the outset that Weinreich has written almost nothing on this subject for the simple reason that ich weiß gar nicht wegen spezifischer Formen von sexualer Entwicklung bei unserer Jugend. Once again, at this crucial juncture, Weinreich confesses ignorance, in some way repeating the move in the introduction that the most polite, respectful approach to the sex lives of young people is to look the other way. Nevertheless, he, ad he adds that there's no doubt that there is a specific character to Jewish adolescent sexuality, but instead of saying what he thinks it is, he allows a Jewish young man to address, to address what he thinks on that subject. Thus, the book ends with a lengthy citation from autobiography number 237, which I'm gonna just give you in a very drastic summary. On sexual questions, Jewish youth takes a recognizable stance, and not only because of pressing economic problems. First of all, the whole attitude of young Jews is comparatively fr uh, open, free of masquerade and hypocrisy. That's very different from what goes on in the Polish gymnasium, with this all sorts of drama, flirtation, where Polish girls dream of love with sweet trembling. Jews lack a feudal chivalric tradition, and their attitude toward love is hard-nosed and balabatish. Practical? I don't know. In this conclusion, balabatish, right? In this conclusion, an adolescent is not only an informant on the nature of Jewish sexuality, he also takes on the role of sociologist, theorist of Jewish difference, historian of Jewish adolescence. We don't have a chivalric tradition. Weinreich, here as elsewhere, resists the impulse to assert his superior adult wisdom on the topic. Let the young people tell their own stories. And I just have to say, I, I know that we're short of time, but actually my favorite uh, part of Der Weg zu unserer Jugend is actually when, when um, when Weinreich ventriloquizes a baby. So his way of, you know, he was also influenced by Freud, and his way of, of describing the Oedipal complex is very different from Freud's. He actually has a whole passage in which he speaks in the voice of a pre-verbal child saying, why do you get to have so much pleasure with your bodies, mommy, daddy? Um, I want to go in there and have sex too. Which is uh, also this amazing stance, which is both ventriloquism and a kind of generosity. The story this young man tells is indeed remar remarkable. Young love, the autobiographer suggests, comes in many different varieties. Young sexuality, far from being the neutral expression of primal sexual drives, act out a series of cultural scripts and that of Siegfried is only one among them. Contra, contra Ariès, this young man knows perfectly well that cultural ideals have nothing to do with cultural realities, and his own culture is informed by a very different set of realities and a distinct prehistory. In quoting this lucid cultural analysis, Weinreich both illustrates and models the embrace of Jewish difference that he saw as the most dignified response to the shock and blow of anti-Semitism. By ending with this quote, Weinreich also models his own relationship to Jewish youth and what he thinks the adult culture around him should also embody. To the attack of Yiddishkeit, 
that comes from a hostile world, Weinreich avoids, attacking, uh, avoids adding the attack of sociology, um, which imposes Jewish identity where it may not be felt. He may have aimed to bring youth into the orbit of Evo, but at least in principle, he hoped that they would come on their own terms, speaking their own experiences in their own voices. His assertions of ignorance are not solely the product of working in a brand new social scientific context or the precondition for honest sociological research. This ignorance was also a humane, principled openness to the autonomy of a young person. By building his work as a tapestry of voices, Weinreich implicitly recognized that the history of Jewish adolescence was not only the province of professional academics, Jews in their literacy, in their belated modernity, were also acutely self-conscious observers of their own difference. Within the web of confusion that rendered relations so tortured between the generations and that made adolescence opaque even to themselves, there was also a form of self-knowledge that was long built into Jewish culture. Weinreich duly recorded the absence of a professional voca vocabulary by which to investigate Jewish adolescence. And he recognized how little he knew about the young people around him. But he also took full measure of what he did know and what they knew decades before Ariès staked his claim to write the first history of European childhood. Thank you. I'm sure that we have many questions, uh, but uh, since we're running late, I'd like to uh, move uh, now uh, to have uh, 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 Barbara Kirschenblatt-Gimblet give her uh, presentation, and then maybe the three of you will come up and take questions, okay? possible to have the lights on the screen down? Most of the, well actually all the presentations, uh, no I think two of the presentation, presentations today focused on adolescence and although my father had an adolescence, and I will say something about it, what he most remembers is what I would call uh, the disorganized aspect of childhood, which is to say those um, arenas of childhood where he could basically do whatever he wanted. And what I'd like to convey is something of the lived experience of one child uh, who remembers his childhood late in life and who also remembered in visual terms. And I think that this mode of, the, the way in which childhood is remembered, I think can be very, very helpful in our conversation today. In fact, the youth autobiographies are also memoirs. You could say that they are memoirs of half a life, so to speak. They're memoirs on the part of youth who are, say, more or less between the ages of 16 and maybe early 20s. Um, and in this instance, uh, this is, a way of remembering childhood that comes many, many, many years later, but very vivid and very, very detailed. And so I will be telling you about a childhood that emerged in conversations that I had with my father between 1967 and the day he died at the age of 93, about eight or nine years ago. And um, it's a very exceptional, a very, very exceptional experience, and it's actually quite informed by the Yibo autobiographies because my father was born in 1916 and in fact in, 19, in the 1930s when Yibo ran three autobiography contests, he would have been old enough to have been one of those autobiographers. And so, uh, but this is a very, very different kind of, I would say, memory of childhood. In fact, Weinreich, uh, made it explicit in the instructions to the, he ran these competitions for the best autobiography, which is sort of a hell of a competition. It's as if my life wasn't worth a prize. But nonetheless, he made it very, very clear that he did not want politicizing ideology, opinions, because he knew that these autobiographies were being written in a highly politicized time. 
His interest was in the psychological reality of youth, and his interests were very psychoanalytic, and they were informed by a very new field, which was the psychoanalysis of adolescence that was pioneered by Siegfried Bernfeld in Vienna. And Weinrich actually uh, visited Bernfeld in Vienna, and Bernfeld was good enough to give him his youth research archive, which is preserved in the YIVO archive. And it was, I think, Bernfeld was really instrumental in Weinreich's thinking. And so Weinreich was interested in the psychological reality of Jewish youth, and he expressly instructed the, the, uh, the uh, youth autobiographers to stay away from political topics and from, if you will, a kind of polemicizing. Uh, so I often wondered, what would my father's autobiography have looked like had he entered the competition? And I don't think it would look anything like the conversations that we had. Because I like to think that I got the right father, he got the right daughter. And the conversations that emerged from that are, are very much a, um, um, I, I would say, a result. So um, basically, so this is what he had to say. He says, I was born in Apatów in Apt, which is in south central Poland, <clears throat> probably between Warsaw and Krakow, a little closer to Krakow and slightly to the southeast. I was born in Apatów in Apt in 1916, and I came to Canada in 1934 when I was 17 years old. I started painting in 1990 when I was 73. Now, why did they call me Meyer July? They called him Meyer Thomas, and he explains that there were many Meyers in the town. There was uh, the, the Groysa Meyer, Kleine Meyer, Meyer, uh, there was Meyer the Goose Carcass. Anyway, he was called Crazy Meyer or Meyer Thomas, Meyer July. He said because in July, it's very hot. When it's very hot, people go crazy. I was a hot-headed kid, so they called me Meyer Thomas, Meyer July. Here you see me wearing the official school uniform. Let me tell you about the herring. And there, it, it, um, I would say that the, 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 the beauty of the, uh, the way in which our conversations developed once he began painting is that he was remembering in words and images. And he has a very, very visual memory and a very, I would say, embodied way of, of remembering. And this, uh, and this, of course, with the distance of time is, is very, very interesting. And so, for example, in this one painting, there are several stories. He starts with the hat. He explains that it was the Polish schoolboy's hat, but that religious boys wouldn't wear that hat because the seams in the hat formed a cross. He then comments on the collar, which was called a Slavatsky collar, which was named for the great romantic Polish poet, Slavatsky, which as Sam indicated, Jewish youth in the interwar years in the 20s and 30s loved the Polish language. That is 90% of, Jew of Jewish youth, more than 90% of Jewish youth went to Polish public schools. Most of them couldn't afford to go to a Jewish day school and pay the tuition. And it was there that they developed a fluency, not only a fluency in the language, but a love of, uh, of the literature. And then, of course, the, the, the blue, the, the navy jacket, the plus fours, the two pairs of so socks, uh, one of them rolled down. His favorite were the red ski boots with brass eyelets and red shoelaces. And he had a lot to say about all of them. And about the herring, you'll have to ask me later. What I found fascinating was that growing up in Apatuf, which was 10,000 people uh, living there according to the 1931 census, with 65% of the population being Jewish, is that it was a town that was of a scale, and I think it would be true of urban neighborhoods in big cities as well, that a child could just run around, see everything, uh, explore everything, and that the, the world of uh, my father's childhood in this town is what I would call transparent in the sense that he could look in windows, that a lot of life was lived outdoors, and that it, not on, we, there were no helicopter parents. Uh, and people weren't worried that their kids would be kidnapped or somehow rather molested and that they had to be accompanied and they had to be supervised and, and uh, there were no cell phones. And he literally um, explored the entire town. In fact, when we were, when I was preparing with him a book based on the tape recorded interviews that we had done over a period of more than 40 years, I noticed that he said he had seven years of school, but he was 15 when he finished Polish public school. 
And I said, there's something wrong here in the calculation. No, 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 he said, I failed a year. I said, you failed a year in school? How's that possible? Well, he said, I played hooky. I said, you played hooky for a year? He said, yes, he said, how do you think I know all about the baker, the butcher, the brush maker, the cooper, the, the barrel maker, the brick, the brick guy, the blacksmith? The... That's what I did for the year. In other words, the school was his classroom, and in time, it became a kind of memory palace. And one of his favorite things was to run around the, the town with a hoop, with a special wire. He actually made it for me that would guide the hoop. And so, over the years, as I interviewed him, I had a notebook, and when I didn't understand something, I would say to him, show me, and he would make drawings in the notebook. And it was through these drawings, for example, how to stencil the walls, because wallpaper was very expensive, so if you had any wallpaper, it would be a, a short panel like this that you would put behind a wall clock. It was actually cheaper to hire somebody to come in and hand stencil all the walls, and he, being a house painter, finally by profession, uh, he remembered in detail how all the walls were painted and even the special kind of brush that was used in addition to the, to the stencils themselves. He remembers how to make a shoe. He said that when he went to the steam bath at the JCC in Toronto, that one of his buddies was a shoemaker from the old country. And he described to him how he described to me how to make a shoe. And he asked the shoemaker, he said, is that right? And the shoemaker's answer was, well, you know, he said, from your instructions, I would know how to make a shoe. And so and he drew for me all the various stages. And of course, uh, in, in a sense, it's a bit like the Diderot Encyclopedia of how all these kinds of things work because he had an extraordinary interest in how things work. I say of him that he was extrospective rather than introspective. If you asked him, how, you know, how do you feel about something, he'd say, what do you mean, how do I feel? But if you asked him how to, to describe um, how to make a shoe, he was off and running. So there was a way in which he engaged with the physical, he, in fact, he would not have been very useful to Max Weinreich, who was interested in the psychological, psychoanalytic. He wouldn't have gotten very far. But in, but in terms of, he's much more, if you will, Diderot than Weinreich in, in his orientation to the world, because he was interested and he knew himself through the way in which he engaged with the material world, but also with, um, I would say, the, the, the people who inhabited that world. And I would, I would give you this one example, and that is he knew this family of shoemakers and they lived essentially in one room or, or two rooms where they had the workshop, the living space, all together. And in this particular case, this, shoemaker, this shoemaker's family, when they had uh, seven daughters, and every time a boy was born, the boy died. And the shoemaker finally was desperate and went to the rabbi and said, what should I do? The, boy, the boys always die. And the rabbi said, look, here's the solution. The next time a boy is born, here's an amulet, but dress him in white. So when the, when the Malach HaMovis, when the angel of death comes to get him, he'll, he'll see that he's in white. He'll think those are burial shrouds, that he's already dead. He'll pass over him, and the boy will survive. And because the, 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 the father said, what am I going to do? I don't have seven dowries. If I don't have a boy, they'll have nobody to say Kaddish for me when I'm dead. And so sure enough, when the boy was born, that's what the, what the father did. And this boy was dressed in these white pajamas um, and up to the point where my father left uh, in 1934. And the, uh, the, so those who survived the Holocaust from the town remembered that this boy was still dressed in, in, in white on October 22nd, 1942, when all the Jews in Apatif were, were deported to, to, uh, to Treblinka, and he died in the, in the white pajamas. Now, my father, um, would, when, when he was describing to me where things were happening, he would say it was on the corner of Ivanska Gas and, uh, and the marketplace. It was at the top of this street, at the bottom of that street. Anyway, I had absolutely no idea where anything was, so I made a list of all the places that he had told me about that were located somewhere in the town, I said, make me a map. And so he made me a map. And these kinds of cognitive map, memory maps are really, really very, very interesting. And we've, we used it when we visited Apatov, and it's actually pretty, pretty accurate, I would say. 
but he also made me a panorama of the town. And the, pa the panorama of the town is very consistent with a history of panoramas of towns already from the medieval period. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that in the historical maps and historical panoramas that we have, the, the um, south is at the top, north is at the bottom, west is on the right, and east is on the left. And in this case, like other panoramas, everything important in the town, <clears throat> no matter where it is, is brought up into the panorama. So it's as if the whole town got tilted and everything got moved up and all of it is there. So there's the marketplace, the town well, the synagogue, and the ancient gate, which was a remnant of the, of the wall. So much of, the li so much of life in the town was lived on the street. And, even, and I would say that in the interwar years in the 1920s and 30s, in many ways, life in the town was a smaller version of life in the city, in the sense that there was a Polish public school, there were a variety of haters, there was every variety of youth groups. Uh, my grandmother was instrumental in the creating of, of the Tarbut school, the Zionist uh, school. Um, there were street performers, the, the circus came to town, and of course, for a, for a child, uh, that 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 made uh, I would say, the town um, was wasn't somehow a sleepy backwater. It it was from a child's point of view, it was a lively place. And so my father remembers a lot of what happened on the street, including the organ grinder with his parrot and the fortunes, and that little boy in the blue uniform. It's like where's Waldo? Yeah, he's in he's almost in every in almost in every image. He remembers also a street performer that was called the Human Fly that uh, used, to, uh, used to be able to climb up the corner stones of the town hall, which was at the end of the marketplace, um, and then somehow or other um, uh, you know, do acrobatic tricks from a pole at the top. Uh, the acrobats that performed on the street, um, the, the uh, cellist that performed in courtyards, and people would wrap up a few coins in a rag and throw it down. And of course, market day, which uh, was every Tuesday, and the marketplace, and some of the tiniest towns had the biggest marketplaces, and on market day, it was absolutely the most vibrant. Lots of the farmers came in with their wagons and their poultry, their eggs. The thieves were there, three card Monty, the woman in red, the prostitute, that was her busiest day of the year, of the week, rather. Um, and so there are many, many, many memories that he has as a kid wandering around and observing everything on market day, including um, the richest man in the town, his wife, whom she, he described her as being always a very intelligent woman, very well-dressed, very, very nice woman. Her husband had a car and a chauffeur, and all he ever did was sort of do one drive around the town with the chauffeur, and, but his wife had a problem and that is she was a kleptomaniac. And so on Thursdays, when the Jewish fish um, people who, who brought the fish to town and the, fish, the fishmongers on the market square were selling the fish, both to Jews for Shabbos and also to Christians for Friday, she actually would steal the fish and he says that she would slip it down her bosom, which I can't believe she would do that. <laughs> I just don't believe it. However, that's what they said. And everybody in the town knew she was a kleptomaniac and so her husband basically said to all the, ta all, the, all, you know, all the shopkeepers, he said to them, listen, she's a nice lady, she's a wonderful wife, she's a great mother, she's got a problem, she's a kleptomaniac. He said, look, just keep track of what she steals and come to me at the end of the week at, or the beginning of the week and I'll pay you for everything. And that actually was a very interesting way since you know, they couldn't cure her, it was a very interesting way of, of dealing with the problem. So the, there was also a livestock market because it was very important not to interbreed the animals. So when the farmers would come on market day, they would also breed the animals. And uh, here, all the animals are breeding. And my father is in the fireman's tower at the very, very top, um, observing the birds and the bees and the pigs and the horses and everything, and everything else, and many, many stories. This was on the edge of the Christian cemetery in a big, big um, area of land. And even in a little town, I mean, basically a small town in South Central Poland, the circus would come once a year. And this was a, you know, an enormous event and with, their, with their beautiful, colorful wagons. They would process through the town to advertise. They would go out to this big open space and set it up. 
and my father has very, very vivid memories of sneaking in without a ticket, and he remembers in detail um, all of the circus acts, and, uh, and for a child, you can well imagine that it was really um, a, a great event. Now, one of the most interesting th things for me is what I would call the autonomous world of the child, and the world not designed by teachers, by parents, by youth group leaders, by um, you know, em emancipated progressive uh, uh, pedagogues like Janusz Korczuk, but really, truly, uh, the autonom the, the, uh, uh, an autonomous world where children basically organize themselves, organize play, make their own toys, and it, it, it tur this is, um, I would say, given today where so much of childhood is organized, uh, this is, uh, and particularly organized, you know, whether it's at home, in the courtyard, on the street, um, or, or in open spaces outside the town, it, it's a really, um, it made for a very, very rich childhood. And it was largely Jewish kids playing with each other, and I think Sam is right that to the degree that they had, quote, uh, Christian friends, they were rather more acquaintances than close friends. So let's start with the courtyard. And here, my father remembers, of course, playing with his hoop, which was his favorite uh, pastime to run around the whole town, but he also had a dog named Finca that's lying in the corner of the courtyard. And then during the day, the, the, the dog would have be on a leash that was a, attached to a wire so that it could run back and forth. Now, uh, what he said that his, his father belonged to the general Zionists. My father also belonged to a Zionist youth group, which, which was Shomer Hale Omi. But the, just so the general Zionist was my grandfather's um, uh, affiliation, and my grandfather would go to their minion, uh, that they had a, a, a space. And it was divided into two parts, as my father remembers. One part was for the prayers, and the other part was for the talkers. And my father would go uh, with his father, but would be, would be, this would be on Shabbos. They would be playing uh, football out, outside in that, in that area. So you can get a little bit of a sense of, um, I would say, a kind of traditional orientation towards religious observance, but not, certainly not a strict one. Um, I, um, I was very interested in the toys that my father made and the games that they played, and he remembered how to make more than 20 different toys. And in fact, he made them for me, and I had him make, make, a, set, make a set for Yivo. And actually, on the third floor, uh, some of the toys that he made, and he would have made them probably um, in the late 60s and the 70s, um, and I made a set, had to make a set for Yivo and a set for the Canadian Museum of Civilization, for the um, Center for Folk Culture, and, uh, and he taught me how to make them, and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that in, in just a moment. But they, of course, uh, these paper, paper boats, which I think they're all different kinds of them. They're not a specifically Jewish toy, but they're one of many, many kinds of toys that he made with nothing, like paper, string, scrap tin, uh, a piece of an inner tube of a tire, like a bicycle tire, uh, string, mm, a hanky, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment as well. And, uh, but playing with them in the gutter after a rain was um, great fun. And of course he said they, they weren't worth anything. We'd make them, play with them, throw them away, and make more. But he says he doesn't ever remember his family ever buying a toy for him. Of course, p families that were well-to-do, families in big cities, they had dolls, they had wagons, they had other kinds of toys. But he remembers making many, many different kinds of toys. And of course, playing a game. This is basically a kind of version of baseball, but with two sticks. Not with a bat, not with a ball, but with two sticks called palant. And the, this is the area that, that, that where the circus was. When the circus wasn't there, that area was used for various things. The kids loved to play palant there. Okay, and the, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, I think. No, what happened? Okay, just a second, let me keep on going. Ah, and then even as a young child, um, uh, it, it, was, it was fascinating for my father just to follow just to follow this label, the, the guy that carried flour in big sacks to, from the mill to the baker. And when he was a little child, he just loved to follow the guy around. And he would tease him with his nickname, is uh, Libela Tulalu. Uh, and so that memory is vivid enough for him to have actually wanted to uh, immortalize it in a painting. 
And of course, there were uh, the Jewish holidays, which were always had a kind of child-centered element. And in this instance, what he remembers very much are the sukkah decorations. In, in this case, the sukkah was, was built right up against the wall of their home. And through a window, they were, his mother was able to pass the food into the sukkah, but he also showed me how to make the sukkah birds from a blown out egg with colored paper for the wings that was shiny and colored on one side and with a little bit of uh, challah moistened to form the, the beak and of course paper chains and apples and things of that kind. Um, of course, I mean, much of what he remembered, he remembered in good weather. So I had tons and tons of stories and paintings that were all set in the spring and the summer. And I said, and I'll show you in a moment, I said, but wait a minute, what happened in the winter? But I'll show you in a moment when he finally told me and painted um, what they did in the winter. But his, um, his boyfriend, Milach Katz, used to say, we would wait for May, it was like waiting for the Messiah and that when the month of May came and the first dew on the grass came, they were in seventh heaven and they used to go and sit outside on the hill outside the Christian cemetery early, early, early in the morning because they said that inside, and my father lived in a house that had two rooms that was near the marketplace opposite the church, that the no matter how hot it was, at night the windows would be shut, the shutters would be locked as a kind of security and that inside the house would be very, very hot. And he had two rooms with two adults, a nanny, a maid, and four boys. And you can imagine what that was like. So my father would get up early, and before everybody else was up, he would sit on the doorstep and read, or in good weather, the boys would go, the Jewish boys would go and sit outside the cemetery and just enjoy the freshness of the May air. So the holidays, whether the holidays were held at home, whether they were in the best medrash, whether they were outdoors, but from a child's point of view, Lagba Omer was a special treat because off they went and they, uh, they basically marched with their cheder teacher to the forest. And what he remembers, uh, particularly in the spring, was teasing snails out of their, out of their shell uh, with a little rhyme that basically said, you know, shlimak, shlimak, and it was a, a actually um, it was a rhyme in Polish as well as in Yiddish, you know, come out of your uh, come out of your your shell. And of course, Polish kids uh, did this as well. And a, and as teenagers, um, of course, the, the on, on Shabbos the favorite thing was to particularly in good weather in the summer to go out into the to the forest and there was a swing. And my father um, is suggesting a little bit of a romantic tryst that you can see in the bushes uh, to the left. Um, so this is uh, on, the, on the theme of, um, of teenage sexuality. So in uh, many ways, uh, his memory map of the town is a map of the places where he used to play. So whether it's the forest and the snails, whether it's the gutter with the rain and the, and the paper boats, or whether it's um, under the bridge on the, on the Opatufka River that ran around the town where there was a drop and there was some kind of boards to try to avoid erosion. And because of the flow of water on it, it, it developed algae and it was slippery. And kids loved to use it as a slide. So he, you know, the river obviously meant something different to adults than it meant to kids. Uh, the, the meadows, which were a great joy, and of course, swimming in the river uh, during the summer. And he didn't have a bathing suit, so he says that he wore his mother's um, black underpants. Well, black underpants actually were what she wore when she was menstruating. Uh, so, you know, this is, um, I, I assure you, these kind of details do not appear in most autobiographies, and there are many other details, some of them quite ribald and sexually explicit, that because by the time he was telling me these stories, and the, my, my, uh, my age, there was no holds barred, and uh, no topic was off limits. Um, then th they loved to fish in the monastery pond. And quite by accident, he caught a duck. And that created a real problem. And his, um, his mother went with the duck to the, to the monks to give it back and to apologize. And um, he, he, he got bit beaten for, for that episode. So there were, uh, that was, I would say, an unexpected uh, consequence. For Tisha B'Av, his memory, of course, is a child's memory of Tisha B'Av, of the 9th of Av, 
And what he loved, what the kids loved to do was, because people went to the cemetery on this day, and what he loved to do and the other kids was to go there, and because it comes late in the summer, there were a lot of burrs, and they loved to throw these burrs at the women and get them caught in their hair. So, and, and there are many other very mischievous things that they would do. For example, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, what they would do is when the, the men were um, out, they would tie the tzitzis from the talasim, so when they would put on their taluses, everything would slip off. Or the bottles of water that the women had, that should they do something untoward and they would like to purify themselves by putting water, they spilled all the water out of the bottles. So the women were running back and forth to get water for their bottles. So they were really, they were, they were a terror, honestly. Uh, they even played in the carp pond, uh, um, catching minnows and a rowing uh, punt. Because with the carp ponds, the carp were, uh, basically what they would do is let the water out of one part of the pond and that would leave, leave the carp flopping and the, the, um, the fishermen could go in with a basket and collect the carp. So what happened in the winter? I said, listen, I, you know, it can't always, there wasn't, there wasn't 12 months of summer, of spring, summer, and early fall. What about the winter? So he actually, uh, he actually made me a miniature sled and sh this is the, 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 the steep street in the town that was the best place in the town for sledding but they also, on the, 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 the pond, uh, in the meadow, they also skated, and they made their own skates, and he made me a pair of skates, uh, which I have to say, they're like basically like wooden clogs with a metal strip underneath and rope to tie it around. They are really, really rudimentary. Um, I don't think it would be so easy to do. Okay, let me see. Oops, am I going the wrong way again? Let me just see. And of course, as they grew older, having parties at home, uh, whether it was with a gramophone or singing and dancing, um, that also became part of the story. To have a bicycle, of course, was the ultimate. Um, and even today, it's the ultimate. Now, um, I had the opportunity, the wonderful opportunity, to lead the development of the core exhibition at Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And I had the great good fortune and the great joy of working with Sam Cassell on the Interwar Years Gallery. And as he indicated earlier, he was the lead scholar for the gallery dealing with the 1920s and 30s. And um, this gallery, um, and I'll, it basically, it's a short period, the 20s and 30s. We divided it into four sections, one dealing with culture, one with politics, one with everyday life in towns, and one dealing with growing up. And um, I, let me start with the um, courtyard uh, part of growing up, and then I'll show you how we dealt with growing up because it captures many of the themes that have already been raised in the presentations today. And in the courtyard, we wanted to present this autonomous world of the child. And the way that we did it was, first of all, a soundtrack where you can hear children reciting y Yiddish counting out rhymes or Yiddish, um, I would say, concatenated speech play and other kinds of rhymes, riddles and puns and jokes, some of them written on the wall. But what we did do, uh, which I was very excited about, was to design a table, the top of which is a showcase, in which I was able to present my father's toys. And in the very center um, is my father with his a willow bark schäufer, or trompeite, which he made for me in probably 1967 or 1968. And what it's it's a all in it, I would say it's um, in English or in England or the UK it would be known as a bark horn or a bark horn. And what it is is it's in the spring when the willow is young and the bark slips off easily. What you do is you cut like a spiral and take the bark off and then you twist it to form this horn. And with a little twig you make a hole to like to to, to peg it. And then with the inner bark, you make a kind of a reed so as to blow. And actually, in the 19th century, Polish peasants made these, but they were this big. They were enormous horns, and they made a huge sound, an enormous sound. But with the decline of this as an adult instrument, it kind of devolves into a child's toy. And when I showed it to the Ethnographic Museum in Warsaw, they said, and in Krakow, they said, my gosh, you know, nobody's seen, nobody makes these anymore. Nobody remembers them. Nobody's ever seen them in the 20th century. So it was, it, but this was something that they made and uh, that he made as a child. So you see here is a paper hat, paper boat. You see um, a knucker, 
made out of newspaper that makes a huge sound. Uh, Cat's Cradle, which was called Etel Betel, or Etel's Bed, uh, and each of the patterns had its own Yiddish name. Uh, you've got a whiz button, the, the thing, the button with the string that you go like this, which actually you know them, they're, they're found in antiquity uh, it, as a kind of a, uh, something that had mystical, that was so magical, and it's the principle of a drill. And then you have a, a misela, a little mouse, and the little mouse, I actually brought one, is really, really fantastic, and that is, it's made from a hanky, and my grandmother used to make it, like the child is crying, so first you, you dig out the hanky, it's like a man's hanky, a big hanky, and you sort of, you know, clean it up a little bit. And then to, to get the kid to stop crying, to distract it, you just make like Jewish origami out of the hanky. And then you, you basically, you make it into a mouse and you, you, you know, oh, oh. <laughs> And of course the kid cannot figure out, and most adults cannot figure out either, how and why the mouse jumps. And then all you do, you know, when everything is settled, all you do is you just go like this, and then you've got your hanky again. So it was really wonderful. So, so, so what I did, uh, and I'm very happy if anybody's, in, and actually we made a little video of my father uh, making this because, and it's really easy to do and it's wonderful, but people don't have men's hankies anymore. Do people have men's hankies anymore? It's gotta be cotton, it can't be something silky or, or like um, synthetic, it's gotta be cotton should be washed, soft, you know, like it can't be starched, but it's, it's the best, it's the best. So uh, we, we did this, and then I taught our educators how to make these toys, and they've been teaching our visitors how to make these toys, and they've been teaching their kids how to make these toys, and these toys are alive and well in Poland today for this cell phone generation. And there's the, uh, the Shoi for the Trompeta, and it's in the Evil Encyclopedia, and it's on display on the third floor. I'm really thrilled that there was an occasion for it to be shown, so this little Maisela, and uh, we have it in the exhibition. So I just want to conclude with a word about how we present uh, childhood, uh, what we call, not childhood, what we call growing up um, as a phenomenon of the interwar years. And it will really, I think, capture, in a way, summarize many of the themes that our speakers today have spoken to so eloquently. So the first, first point I want to make is that we set, and actually uh, Sam used this expression, of the Yiddish Agas. Um, we call the interwarrior gallery on the Jewish street, and we take it from the Yiddish expression, what's doing on the Jewish street, meaning in the Jewish world. And, um, and it's an interwarrior street, uh, projected onto a relief surface, and we draw heavily on the Yivo autobiographies. These autobiographies are just phenomenal, and I think approximately 600 of them uh, were submitted in the course of three contests during the 1930s. And the last contest, the winners were supposed to be announced, if I'm not mistaken, on September 1st, 1939, if you can imagine. And miraculously, uh, most of these, or I think many, most of these autobiographies in fact, did survive, and, um, and we, we have them today. A selection of them were translated and published as Awakening Lives, and you can order it on Amazon for almost nothing. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I highly recommend it. It was edited by Jeffrey Chandler, and there's also a Polish um, edition that features the Polish autobiographies because youth uh, wrote these autobiographies in Polish, Yiddish, and English. And as Sam indicated, uh, increasingly in the 1930s, Jewish youth were, were speaking Polish. In fact, my father, of course, sp uh, spoke Yiddish um, at home, learned Polish at school, but what was so interesting is that in his Zionist youth group, when they would go on Hachshara or they would go to some kind of summer camp outing um, and they would sing and they, they would speak to each other and sing in Polish. And I said to him, I don't understand, like, why you're a Zionist youth group? Why would you talk and sing in Polish? Well, he said, we didn't want to speak Yiddish and our Hebrew wasn't good enough. And so Polish was, was the language. And so we have youth autobiographies in Polish, I, I think also for other reasons, and they're really, really wonderful. And we begin, in fact, with generational conflict. And this is exactly what Naomi Saibu was talking about when she uh, described, or she actually quoted from Max Weinreich. And we have a, a whole bunch of family photographs, and in a single photograph, you can actually see a multi-generational conflict. It's not just between parents and children, but you can see three, four generations, 
and the whole sort of range of positionings uh, with, uh, that, that really suggest um, the, I would say, the pace of change and the generation gap. And it's reflected in the autobiographies as well. And so we start with, if you will, children in families having to deal with the generational gaps and generation, generational conflict. And we have an interactive table with, a fam with what we call the family album where our visitors can explore those stories. We go then from inside the home to the courtyard. And that's what I call this autonomous uh, space of children's, um, I would say, cultural creativity, self-organization, uh, a, a space of play, space of toys, speech play, games, and that kind of thing. We move from there to the school system, to the educational school system. And in fact, Jewish school systems, plural, with a great pride of interwar year Jews. And we present four school desks, each one dedicated to one of the four major school systems. So of course, Tarbut, uh, the Zionist system, uh, Tsisho and the Yiddish secular school system, the Polish language Jewish uh, gymnasium, and finally to the traditional schools uh, of Cheder and Yeshiva. And we have a wall that where we take, uh, I think one, two, three, four, six of our autobiographers, and we show what their paths were through the school system. None of them went to university. How far did they go? Did they get as far as public school? Did they continue on to teacher's seminary? Where, where, what precisely were their options? And of those options, which ones were they able to actualize? And it's, it's a way to provide a kind of glimpse um, uh, at one time of the whole, if you will, set of educational opportunities and lack of ability to, to take care of, to, to, be, to actualize them. We go from there to a presentation of, I would say, well, first of all, Yanish Korchak, this wonderful Jewish educator, and his, um, I would say, really path-breaking, very, very inspiring ideas about children as autonomous beings, even from the youngest age. And at, at the same time, Jewish organizations that were really dedicated to progressive forms of child care and child rearing. One of the interesting um, uh, developments in this regard, and very, very much um, the work of Korchak, was a newspaper, a child's newspaper called Mawicz Przeglunt, which was a supp supplement to the adult Polish paper Nasz Przeglunt, which was a Jewish daily in Polish with a Zionist orientation. And we actually uh, created a beautiful interactive presentation of Mała Przeglunt, which was intended to be written by, edited by, and read by children. And we end the growing up section with adolescence and the, I would say, the, the point at which um, young people really have to now go out to work and deal with all of the burdens and the challenges of adulthood. And it's here that uh, the club or the locale of the youth group becomes so important. And Sam had the brilliant idea of trying to stage or at least install something that could be staged as something called a Kestel oven or a um, oven evening. And what it was was in the locale, in the club, there'd be a table, there'd be a box, and the young people that had gathered would, be, would write down their questions anonymously, put them in the box, and then one of them would lead the discussion of the answers to the questions. So they would pull out a question and read it. It might be about sex, it might be about immigration, it might be about conflict, it could be about anything. And they would have a discussion. And I actually, well, one of the things we'd like to do is actually to be able to do something like that uh, with our visitors. And so um, the, 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 I would say it may be that until today, there was not the awareness that at Evo, none of the collections are specifically marked as childhood, but there, are, there is a place where growing up and Jewish childhood and adolescence is actually given a very, very significant space, and that is at Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Thank you.
So I want to uh, thank again our speakers for their truly brilliant uh, and wonderful and enlivening presentations. And we have some time now for questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for fabulous, fabulous presentations and for this has been a wonderful uh, afternoon. I have a question about the um, Hasidic and ultra-Orthodox youth. Because uh, from what I understand, the, the childhood and adolescent periods that were described here referred mostly to secular or Bundes, to sort of more assimilated um, uh, children uh, growing up in Poland. And I was wondering whether, what Barbara mentioned about 90% of Jewish children going to public schools where Polish was the language of instruction. Did it apply to uh, Hasidic children as well? Or sort of, if, and I think all of you could sort of address this, were they the readers of the, um, the children's books? Um, was Weinreich dealing with them in, the, um, in his analysis? I would be curious to hear your um, insight on that. Yeah. Thank you, Hayagi. Um, I, I think Sam already said, I mean, the largest school system was the one that was, that was run by the Aguda, so which was separate boys and girls. There were actually, um, uh, the Aguda had, just in terms of youth movements, a very vibrant, actually a kind of weird split in Aguda because there was something called Seire Aguda Sisroel, which was the official boys youth movement. Um, and then there was Poale Agudas Israel, which was had so, uh, a little bit of a socialist uh, bent, which also had a lot of young people in it. And one was more, um, they, they sort of illustrated the two kinds of youth movements. One insisted on a greater, one, one was more conservative than the other. Um, in terms of Weinreich, yes, he talked a lot about uh, Orthodox uh, Jews and Hasidic Jews. And of course, there was also a girls youth movement, there was Bas uh, Benos, Agudas Israel, which I have a picture there. There was also Basia, which was a children's movement run by Benos. So it was like, I, I don't know if this was true of any of the other youth movements, but a youth and a children's movement where, where the U Benos girls who, who were between the ages of 14 and 18 were also leaders in the Basia movement. Um, so, uh, uh, Weinreich certainly s talks a lot about um, uh, orthodoxy and um, I among the things he talks about are, are people leaving and people going into it, you know, going back and forth. He also believes, I mean, his basic theory of, you know, he has this theory of compensation, which is the psychic compensation that Jews have developed against the blow of anti-Semitism. And he basically talks about the, psychic compensation as being, the reason why there's not any psychic compensation is because people no longer buy the orthodox line. He basically believes that it's the orthodox who have the best, he basically believes that orthodox Judaism is a form of psychic compensation through feelings of superiority. Um, and that orthodox, young orthodox, even young orthodox Jews no longer have the kind of self-confidence in Jewish superiority which he believes is part of or an orthodox uh, upbringing, but that somehow requires a certain kind of bolstering that these youth movements are trying to do. So, so that's, that's what I got, honey. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, uh, there are Orthodox youth who wrote autobiographies. And oh yeah, Esther. Yeah, yeah, and we have them in the, in the collection, and we actually selected uh, some of them for our, you know, for our interpretation. Uh, why did they uh, put two sticks in it in something, whatever, whatever it's called, oh, it's, uh, of two sticks. How do you play the How do they play baseball with two sticks? Oh, how do you play baseball with two sticks? You know what you do, the listen. Ball? They didn't have a ball? No, no, because it, it's called palant, it's not called baseball. So basically, that's actually a great question. So basically what you do is you have one stick is on the ground and you hit it, and when you hit it, 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 it flies. 
and, and that's basically, so you don't throw it, but you use one stick to hit the other stick. There, it, there must be a version of it here too. Well, you, listen, they, you know, I, I, I tell you, that, listen, you, listen, two sticks, you got a game. Oh, stick ball. Oh, yeah. it may, maybe that's maybe. Okay, so you 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 go like this and then you hit it, yeah. and it flies up. Yeah. Who played it? Who's played it? My grandfather played on the Lower East Side. There you go. Does it have a name? Oh, yeah. What did they call it? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Stickball's got a ball. And this is two they sticks. They have a ball? Well, actually, they, like this, they, they, did, they had two things. First of all, they did have a ball for their football, for football, but they said that it was so pathetic that they had to keep on patching it, patching it all the time because it was deflating. But they also made a ball out of rags. They had a mm -hmm. rag ball. Yeah, yeah. So you see, you don't need much, and you can actually have a good time. I think there's a question here. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all because this was a fabulous afternoon. I came in, I was away in New Jersey, and it was great to come and hear this. Uh, uh, really wonderful. I just wanted to say about an issue that came up, several speakers, about the use of Polish, just to mention that uh, my father, who was the uh, grandson of a great Hasidic Rebbe, and went to an ultra-religious school, but nevertheless, he was taught Polish to a very high level. Now, I don't know if that's because of government requirement uh, in, those, in, in the interwar period, but it gave him, even though he had no love for Poland or Pol Polish culture, it gave him a lifelong love of Polish poetry because of the amount, immense amount of it he had to memorize in this ultra-religious school and how much he came to love Polish poetry, something he didn't mentioned to most people except to me, but I knew it about him. Uh, also, uh, I just say that uh, from my mother, I learned how to, that game with the mouse, with the cloth mouse, and, uh, and uh, also girls, another thing that girls did was they used, in the poverty where they had so few toys, it was very common to play a game where we, as a substitute for dolls, girls would dress up their knee as a doll and uh, you would pretend that your knee was a doll. Your knee would pretend to be a doll, <laughs> pretending to be a baby, right? And it was uh, 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 part of uh, how, uh, how girls managed, uh, actually. Also, Barbara mentioned about Tisha B'Av, that they would throw what Burst. were called Tisha B'Av shtekers at the girls. But the, the ideology, there was a formal ideology behind it, which was that Tisha B'Av shtekers were collected by the boys to be thrown in the, through the windows at the people praying on Tisha B'Av. And the official ideology behind it, of course they would be yelled at by people and chased away, but the ideology behind it was that they would fall into people's beards and then it would be very painful to remove them. So they had to cry, which is what you're supposed to do on Tisha B'Av. So that made collective Tisha B'Av stackers into a mitzvah, so to speak. That was, uh, but the, the last thing I'd like to say, just as a, is uh, that uh, a problem that uh, didn't get discussed, in the flux, which I think you've all described as so complicated between religious, non-religious, socialist, and not, and so on, in this rich layering of complexity, uh, my father remembered that there were people in Poland who were themselves very rigorous in their religious practice, but there were some people who felt that, nevertheless, that couldn't last. And they sent their children to secular schools, and without even an expectation, with the expectation that, well, that wouldn't last into their world. And that uh, there was some sense that the future looked so bleak in Polish Jewish life for many that they didn't feel that their own culture could continue. And I once asked the late Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik, if, and he told me he had the same recollection of, uh, of the pessimism of it. And another aspect of that pessimism was that by the 1930s, 
it became very difficult for yeshiva graduates, male yeshiva graduates, to make shiduchim, to make uh, marriages, because people didn't see a future in that world and in that life. They were deeply pessimistic about it. Uh, anyway, that's a little sure. recollection. Thank you. I just, uh, if I could, I want to make a corre uh, correct myself. A kestel oven is a box evening. So a kestel is a little box, and the box is the box that you put all the things in. So I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, it's a kestel. Uh, I have just one comment, which is for the children's day that we have next year, Barbara is going to have to yeah, teach us how to make the mouse, make mouse, and we are going to teach the children how to make mouse mice. A little bit, a little snot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> it's a clean hanky, I think. <laughs> right, yeah, right, really. right. And real ones. Did the kids have any theater education um, when your father was in, um, where was he? Oh. Um, hey, hey, tell me again, did, did he have? Theater, theater. Theater. Oh, you, you know what? Actually, in his town, there was probably an amateur theater group, but what he really remembers, and he made a wonderful painting, is of the, what happened on Purim. Because the uh, workers, not, not uh, workers, would men <coughs> and boys, they would dress up, they would go from house to house, and they would perform a Purim play in the house of people, wealthy people, who would give them something to eat, something to drink, give them a little bit of money. And one of their favorite plays was a play of a wedding that uh, Polish peasants from the region of Krakow used to perform, and they would dress up as women, had a wig with like yellow braids, they had big hats, they had these sort of rainbow colored capes, and they would pretend to be, um, they would pretend it was a wedding. And they had musicians, so there was that kind of theater. But my father, he remembers a mandolin orchestra, and he remembers plays being performed, but he himself never, he was never in a drama group. I'll say one other thing about um, theater and children's experience of theater. Um, I'm doing a, a big project about Yiddish children's literature and um, creating an anthology, a collection of different pieces. And one of the kinds of literature that we find in Yiddish, much more so than in American or British traditions, is we find plays for children. And some of them have people as characters, and some of them have animals, and some of them have objects. But it seems like one way that children liked to have fun was to put on plays or theatricals for their friends and for their families. It was a big part of Jewish, Yiddish-speaking childhood in general, it seems. Can I, can I also throw something in? So the, um, the woman who started Orthodox Girls Education, Sarah Schneer, was also a playwright. And Beis Yaakov was, in many towns, the biggest thing in town was the play, the Beis Yaakov play. Very often it was for, for girls, for little girls. Um, and we have tons of photos of girls in plays. And this was an all girls school, so it was girls dressed like boys, because there are boys, char male characters in the plays. And in one, I just read a story in a Yiddish paper about one uh, town, I forget which town it was, where the, the Beis Yaakov school was putting on a play. And these were things they worked on for months. And they actually rented out the movie theater in town. And the boys were so jealous that all the girls were in a play that the boys decided to disguise themselves as girls <laughs> to get into the play where the boys, where girls were wearing boys' clothes because they were male hair. And the Ger Hasidim, who in that town, it was a town with a lot of Ger Hasidim, they formed a cordon around the theater and made sure that all the people going into the movie theater were girls and women. And, but some boys managed to sneak in ahead of time into the women's section or the, the balcony, kind of. And they were discovered in the middle of the play, and it created this <laughs> riot. <laughs> And then they wouldn't leave. <laughs> so this made it to the newspaper. Uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> yes. Uh. Any more questions? OK. Thank you all very much.